March 16th, 2023, coming up on Roland Martin Unfiltered, streaming live on the Black Star Network. He's the third African American governor elected since Reconstruction. We'll be chatting with Governor Westmore of Maryland. The Texas Education Agency has taken over the Houston Independent School District. Black elected officials are not happy about that at all. We'll discuss all that and more today on the 196th anniversary of the founding of the first black newspaper, Freedom Journal. It is time to bring the funk on Roland Martin Unfiltered. Let's go. Great to me. Folks, he is the third African American elected governor in the United States since Reconstruction. Wes Moore is the new governor of Maryland. And of course, he also is a proud man of Alpha Phi Alpha. Glad to have you on the show. Frat, how you doing? It's good to see you, Frat. How you doing? I'm doing great. Uh, you have had uh, quite a time thus far since uh, your inauguration. Uh, folks there in uh, the state of Maryland are quite happy, but obviously uh, it's also about getting down to business. What is your focus in your first year? Well, our, our focus in the first year is what we said the whole focus is the entire administration. This is about creating pathways for work, wages, and wealth. How are we making sure that all families have an opportunity to be able to have employment that pays them a fair wage and that allows them to create generational wealth for them and their families? And I think you've seen from the very first days of our administration, that has been the push, whether it has been being able to enhance, uh, you know, enhance options for people to be, to be able to enter into the workforce, uh, being able to create a service year option for all high school, uh, all high school graduates to have a year of service to the state of Maryland making sure we're pushing for a $15 minimum wage uh, and, and ensuring that people are not working, in some cases working multiple jobs and still living below a poverty line, and then also focusing on things like educational supports, business supports, being able to address the 8 to 1 racial wealth gap. This is about work, wages, and wealth, and that's going to be the push of our administration. Well, one of the things that I have often talked about also is that uh, the need to expand uh, contracts, African Americans being able to be a part of of, of the economic advancement in this country, and all too often we have not seen that. Uh, your focus there uh, in Maryland on that particular issue as well. Yes, and, and I tell you, we're uh, we're proud of the fact that we're leading on this. Where, and then in my first days, I signed an executive order uh, that is requiring all of our agencies, all of our departments, to be able to give us a plan as to how they plan on hitting the 29% goal that Maryland has when it comes to MBE participation, but that Maryland has come nowhere near hitting. For, uh, far too often in the state of Maryland, we allow ourselves to give away these free waivers, or we allow business to be given out by simply saying, well, we made a good faith effort to find MBE participation and we couldn't find it. Those days have come to an end. And so I actually signed a historic executive order actually ensuring that all of our departments are actually hitting the target of 29 percent 
MBE participation, and ensuring that the entire state of Maryland is going to be one that is going to not just hit those targets, but also exceed from those targets as well. Uh, and uh, again, contracts is one thing, but building capacity is another. Obviously, when you talk about that in places like Baltimore, that, of course, major city in the state of Maryland has some significant issues. How are you looking to work with the mayor there, Brandon Scott, and other elected officials to improve the plight of African Americans and others in that city? Yes, I mean, well, I, I think about some of the core reasons why I uh, why I ran in the first place, and you know, I, this this issue is personal to me because you know I'm a, I'm a Baltimorean. And I take this, and I and I have not just a deep sense of pride in Baltimore. I take personally the idea that you cannot have a thriving state of Maryland if you do not have a healthy city of Baltimore. And so that's why you see we made significant investments within the city of Baltimore, earmarked parts in our budget that focuses exclusively on things like uh, downtown and Harbor Place, and also and also uh, uh, the, uh, the the infrastructure that we have within the city of Baltimore, but also ensuring that we can focus on things like safety that people have a right to feel safe in their own communities, in their own homes, and in their own skin, that we have record historic investments in public education, where literally we've made the largest investment in public education of any governor in the history of the state of Maryland, and also focusing on transportation assets, because we've got to be able to move people from where they live to where opportunity lies. And so in order for Maryland to thrive, it means we have to have a city of Baltimore, its largest city, that's going to help lead the charge. So many folks, so many Democrats are scared to death uh, of being tagged as being soft on crime. Uh, the previous governor uh, often would have the attorney general try to take over cases from the state's attor state attorney there, Marilyn Mosby. Uh, we got elections next year as well. And again, it's crime, crime, crime. But what I keep saying to folks is you cannot have a conversation about crime if you don't have a conversation about what actually leads to crime, and that is lack of jobs, lack of opportunities, and education as well. Uh, and so, how are, you, how are you going to make that case to folks in the state that uh, don't just simply say, let's throw more money at cops to deal with crime, but let's confront the root condition uh, of crime and poverty? Hey, uh, first of all, you're absolutely right. And, and the thing that we have to do is, and where I tell people, I, you know, I, I am data-driven and heart-led. Where I tell people, I wear my heart on my sleeve and I acknowledge that, but I know this, data matters. And I don't move without data. And the thing that we do know is this, you are never going to incarcerate or militarize your way out of a larger public safety challenge. And so that means, yes, do we have to make sure that we are, uh, we are fixing our parole and probation system and our Department of Corrections because we have massive vacancies? In the, in the state of Maryland when it comes to, we have over 10,000 vacancies in the state of Maryland uh, of, among state jobs to include things like parole and probation and Department of Corrections, absolutely. But the reality though is this, if you are not investing in an education system, if you are not creating pipelines for young people to be able to have second chances, if you still have situations where, where people cannot drink from the water fountains, because of lead poisoning, or people do not have transportation assets that can get them from where they live to where opportunity lies, then you will consistently find yourself just cleaning up the debris that comes from broken systems. We can't do this. And being able to make sure that we have a police force that moves with appropriate intensity and absolute integrity and full accountability is important. But this is not about the police exclusively. You've got to deal with the root causes of why we continue watching people feeling less safe in their own neighborhoods and, and in their own communities. And are you, are you also making that case to other Democrats across the country who are running for re-election next year, including the president? Uh, because, again, in, in my estimation, it's so much... Uh, they are so scared to death of the phrase defund the police when what really people are talking about is how do you reimagine policing? How do you put its resources into mental health? How do you deal with cases like that? How do you also get officers to stop beating folks that's also costing cities millions and millions and millions of dollars that are going to waste because of police brutality? And I, I think what we have to do and what we're doing here in Maryland is we're leading by example. And we're showing folks that, you know, we have been offered a bunch of false choices. And we've been offered a bunch of false choices that simply tells us that it's one way or the other. And so what we've shown here in the state of Maryland is that we can actually support and make sure that local law enforcement are getting the training and the recruiting that they need. It's part of the reason why we put, you know, we put forth $122 million in supporting the training and the mechanisms for local law enforcement. 
But at the same time, we have to address the fact that Maryland incarcerates more black boys between the ages of 18 and 25 than anywhere else in this country. Number two is Mississippi. But it's not a choice. We have to be able to do both. And that's the thing that we want to be able to push in on for and how we're going to lead by example here in the state of Maryland, that yes, we want to make sure that we're supporting local communities and ensuring that law enforcement have, have that we're, have, we're recruiting proper and well-trained and ethical and transparent law enforcement. And at the same time, knowing that our solution is never going to be just lock up more children. That's not going to be the answer. Uh, education. We've got a couple of minutes left. Uh, I know you have to go. We do want to deal with education. Uh, the governor, after after repeated pressure and the, and the legislature overruling him, Governor Hogan was overruled, uh, signed the historic settlement uh, for HBCUs, money that they were owed, but you also still have to deal with future investment. Uh, so let's talk about your education priorities from HBCUs, but then also, of course, K through 12, uh, because really the colleges are at the end of the line. What happens K through 12 is really critically important when it comes to your future workforce. That's exactly right. And, and you're right. I mean, we, we're, we're coming from a situation here in the state of Maryland where HBCUs had to sue the state in order to get money that was, that, was, that was owed to them. And so if you look at our budget, in our first proposed budget, we invested, and I mean a historic investment, of $421 million going towards Maryland's HBCUs, a historic number. But in addition to that, you're absolutely right, we made a historic investment in our K-12 public education system. Because for everything that we're looking to accomplish, it's going to be because education is going to help to lead the way. And when you think about the type of assets that we have here in the state of Maryland, uh, the fact that we have four of the top HBCUs in America here in the state of Maryland, every single pipeline that we're looking to fill from nurses, from nursing to education, to cyber technology, to life sciences, the genius of our state is being produced in our HBCUs and our K-12 system every single day. But if we're not investing in that, that genius will never show itself. And so that's why you've seen we have made it unparalleled, unparalleled investments in ensuring that our students and our children are on the proper pathway to work wages and wealth. Uh, indeed. Well, Governor, uh, more glad to have you on the show. Look forward to having you back. Uh, and good luck uh, with uh, a, a very tough job. It's not easy uh, being in the uh, top spot, but uh, uh, I think uh, you were uh, trained appropriately for it. Yes, sir. You know I was. You know I was. God bless you. I appreciate it, Frat. Take care. Take care. Uh, all right, folks, got to go to break. We'll be back right here, Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Coming up on the next Black Tape, a conversation with Professor Howard W. French on his new book, Born in Blackness, covering 600 years of global African history and helping us understand how the world we know today is a gift from Black people. There could have been no West without Africa and Africa. That's on the next Black Table with me, Greg Carr, only on the Black Star Network. Hatred on the streets, a horrific scene, a white nationalist rally that descended into deadly violence. Soil, you will not white people are losing their damn minds. As an angry pro-Trump mob storms the U.S. Capitol, we're about to see the rise of what I call white minority resistance. We have seen white folks in this country who simply cannot tolerate black folks voting. I think what we're seeing is the inevitable result of violent denial. This is part of American history. Every time that people of color have made progress, whether real or symbolic, there has been what Carol Anderson at Emory University calls white rage as a back. This is the rise of the Proud Boys and the Boogaloo Boys. America, there's going to be more of this. There's all the Proud Boys, guys. This country is getting increasingly racist in its behaviors and its attitudes because of the fear of white people. The fear that they're taking our jobs, they're taking our resources, they're taking our women. This is white fear. Do. This is Diallo Riddle, and you're watching Roland Martin, Unfiltered. Stay woke.
All right, folks, uh, I want to bring my panel right now. Uh, glad to have them here. Reese Colbert, host of Reese Colbert Show. Uh, Crystal Knight, she's a Democratic strategist and will be joined by Greg Carr, Department of Afro American Studies at Howard University. Reese, I'll start with you. Uh, the job, uh, again, the top job of governor, huge responsibility. Governor Westmore uh, is now, uh, folks are calling him, uh, uh, you know, the next star. And I always, I always say this all the time. Uh, and it's not just about him, it's about anybody. I say, let them do their job first before folks start trying to anoint them for the next job, okay? Mm -hmm. There were people, he hadn't even been inaugurated yet, and folks were saying, he should run for president in 2024. I was like, y'all, will y'all breathe? You kind of <laughs> got to get inaugurated first. Uh, and that's all, and I, that's the advice that I would give any African American who's elected to a new job, don't fall for the media hype of you're the next star Focus on the job and then build from there. That is true, but I will say that Governor Westmore is a superstar. <laughs> I think that he is incredibly dynamic, incredibly charismatic, but most importantly, he has his head in the right place when it comes to policy. And what we're seeing in Maryland is what happens when you have Democrats in control of both the legislature and the executive branch, uh, in terms of the appointments that he's made and with the emphasis on diversity and in terms of working with the Democratic legislature to undo a lot of the damage that— um, uh, Governor Larry Hogan did. I mean, he got a lot of credit for being a never Trumper and for being on the moderate side when you compare him to the likes of a Tate Reeves or Greg Abbott. But the reality was that he was an obstructionist to a lot of the more progressive things that the Republic, I mean, that the Democratic legislature tried to do. So I think with uh, Governor Moore in charge, and then we have uh, Anthony Brown as the attorney general, and we have um, a number of people in really high positions that I think are going to turn Maryland into a state to really watch in terms of being on the forefront of progressive values on the East Coast. Uh, Crystal, the, the reason I make that point about uh, just sort of tempering expectations uh, is because, again, if people get so locked into the media hype and not mm -hmm. on... I mean, like, for a perfect example, Arthur Davis. Oh, my God, all of these people were saying he was going to be the next Obama. Well, what ended up happening? He runs for governor, he loses, he, he, he screw screws over Obama, supports Mitt Romney, bounces back as a Republican, Democrat, Republican, Democrat, uh, and where is he right now? And that's why I tell people, listen, let people do their jobs first. Let them build from there uh, and, and not uh, all of a sudden just start trying to uh, call other things. Let him be the governor of Maryland. And guess what? When he kills it, then it's all right. You know what's next, and so that's just that's just one of the things that, that I'm just always want to caution people on because media jumps out there real quick in trying to label folks, and then they don't let them do the work. Absolutely, I think you know the media is powerful in that it's able to paint a narrative about anyone, quite frankly. And if you play the same story over, if you play the same narrative over and over, then people begin to believe that because people, unfortunately, don't always read or go back and do the background and the history um, on, you know, things that they see and hear in different media sources. But I agree with you. I think Westmore just got elected. I mean, it's not <laughs> been a full year of his term. And so we need to see him actually lead these policies that he just spoke about, will those actually come into fruition? Um, it sounds very ambitious and aggressive, and I'm wishing him the best, but absolutely, he needs to have a record of things that he's done before he's able to move on to the next role or to the next thing. I think the other thing that's really interesting here is that as people continue to speculate that he should run for president um, in the future, they're skipping over a number of different other, you know, governors or senators senators or just other candidates who could be out there. But I think the bottom line for me is that the Democratic Party, which is our party, my party, we need to do a better job of building the bench. If we build a really solid bench, we have a good number of people that we can pick from so that any new shiny candidate like Wes Moore who comes about, we're not all grabbing, hoping that he will be the next great hope, hoping that he will be the next person to save this party, when we have the time right now to really cultivate cultivate leadership, cultivate new leaders all across this country so that when it's time to pick new leadership, we have people who are credible, 
who are tested and who have real results that they can point to as they think about ascending to run for president. Um, one of the things uh, that um, he's dealing with here, Reese, Democrats control the House and the Senate, now the governor's mm -hmm. mansion. But also the top two, four positions in Maryland are African-American. You're talking about the mm -hmm. governor, you're talking about the attorney general, uh, and of course, uh, leadership uh, in, in the House and the Senate. Uh, the, thing, the thing here is he has something that very few Democrats have uh, in terms of whether they're able to control all forms of uh, government. That's also uh, why it's going to be critical in terms of that agenda, uh, really putting something forward that speaks for the people. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I think that there's plenty of evidence that that's, that that's happening. I mean, his priorities are passing in the legislature right now or in, you know, the different phases of it. The uh, legislative calendar is almost up in Maryland, so it will be not long before we see the actual results of what he can get through the legislature and his priorities. But I definitely think that he's incredibly well positioned. And I would just want to clarify, stars are not only presidents in this party. I mean, we used to have where we recognized governors as stars, where we recognized senators as stars. And it wasn't just that everybody needs to be president. We recognize the power of these offices. And the fact that he is the only black governor in the country, one of the few black governors to ever have been elected in this country, I think that's significant in and of itself without even looking later on mm -hmm. down the pipeline. Um, uh, Crystal, I think also uh, when you mentioned the whole issue uh, of the bench. Uh, and look, he ran a very effective race. And I think when you look at, now granted, Maryland is a different state than others. Uh, but we got to go back just four years. I mean, Ben Jealous, when he ran uh, for governor against Larry Hogan. And so the groundwork had been laid, if you will, uh, for mm -hmm. Wes Moore. Uh, and in terms of the people that were in place, there were a number of African Americans who were trying to ascend to the governor's mansion uh, who, mm -hmm. who fell short. Uh, but I do think uh, black candidates across the country should look at how he ran this race in terms of when they are seeking statewide office in other states around the country. Absolutely. You know, and I also think we have to remember that Anthony Brown, who's all, who's now the attorney general, he also ran as well, and he was unsuccessful. So even before Ben Jealous, um, there was other work or groundwork, as you say, that had been done to prepare the land for a Westmore to actually become governor. But I agree with you. You know, there are um, many other um, candidates that across this country that deserve, um, you know, to ascend to whatever position, quite frankly, that they desire within their respective states. Um, and it, it just depends on what the nature of the state is. As you stated, Maryland is different and um, that they, you know, it's generally and traditionally been a democratic state. Um, although Larry Hogan was able to serve eight years under the gubernatorial sh um, ship. But, you know, Westmore... Um, I am excited about his candidacy. I'm excited about his governorship. Um, but I also would like to see the things that he has planned for the state, and I hope that he's able to accomplish those things. Uh, I do want to talk about this here, um, and uh, I'll try to pull it up here. Um, I got a kick. Uh, uh, so there was a, uh, some comments that were made uh, by actress Amanda Seals. Uh, with regards to Vice President Kamala Harris. Let's just say that Reese wasn't too particularly happy with her comments. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and yeah, yeah, come on now. You know I pay attention to everything. Uh, and so uh, this is what uh, Seals had, had to say uh, about uh, Vice President uh, Harris. And I want to get uh, you commenting. I'm going to put in uh, Dr. Greer Carr. When Kamala said this ain't a racist country, she lost me. And right. she ain't got me back yet. Mm. We have a country that was 1,000% built on the foundation of racism that now legislators are trying to pretend didn't happen and are getting that through and doing it on an education level and on a DEI level. You cannot, as the second in line to the highest form of office in this country, you can't get in there in that position and then make such an egregiously false statement. When Kamala said so, this ain't a racist country, um, she lost me. And so she, she said an egregiously false statement. Uh, I was on The Breakfast Club um, uh, yesterday. It was the day before. We taped it on Tuesday. Uh, it, it aired yesterday. And, and I made this comment to Charlemagne and DJ Envy Reese, where I said there's a difference between offering a critique, mm -hmm. offering criticism, and being reckless. 
And what I meant by reckless is when you don't tell the whole story. When mm -hmm. you tell partial story. Well, you put a mm -hmm. video out and you uh, were critical of Amanda's comments by saying she didn't tell the whole story. Mm-hmm. Oh, oh, I thought you were going to play the video. Okay, no, yeah. No, no, I don't need to play it. You're right here. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, no, no. Well, and see, this, this is, that's exactly my problem. I think what happens is we live in a headline culture. We live in a meme culture where one sentence get plastered on because you can have it in 60 size font and have all kinds of colors on it. And people take that and run with it. The reality is if you're looking for a person to humor you and speak the exact words in the exact manner that you want them to, you're never going to be satisfied with anybody under those circumstances. But if you're mm -hmm. looking for a person who does the work and if you're looking for the policy, the action and the leadership, then that's a standard that I can get behind. Because the reality is, yes, Kamala Harris did say, no, I do not think that America is a racist country, but we do have to recognize the history of racism and its existence today. And so on and so on and so forth. And so if you're a person who malfunctions after one sentence is like, Ugh, five words, too much, and you only want to harp on the first five seconds, I don't know what I can do for you. I don't know if there's any kind of intellectual argument that we can have here. But the reality is, if you're concerned about her erasing racism and its existence, clearly she acknowledged that. If you're concerned about the fact that we have a domestic terrorism problem fueled by white supremacy, in the same exact interview, she pointed out that. And I will add that when she was a senator, she got up Christopher Ray's ass over what the FBI was doing doing to combat white domestic extremist terrorism specifically, which nobody said boo about then. So it's important to have context. It's important to recognize that the soundbite may not be satisfactory to you, but the policy and what she's being getting done in 2021 was the worst year for black maternal deaths in history. It's 10 times, you're 10 times more likely to die in this country from childbirth than you are in Japan and other advanced nations. And that is something that Vice President Kamala Harris has put the full weight and, of the and, White House behind. And Crystal, here's so your deal. That's what I'm talking about. And Crystal, here's your deal. Those of us who've been covering this for a very long time, if, if Vice President Kamala Harris had said America is a racist country, nothing she said after that will be re re replayed. The reality is this, when you're in certain positions of elected office, mm -hmm. when 71% of the total electorate are white in the 2020 mm -hmm. election, there are mm -hmm. things you probably think, probably know, but you can't say. Right. It's called right. politics. Called mm -hmm. politics. I totally agree. And Amanda Seals knows this. And I don't understand this this whole Kamala Harris hate train. There's been several articles that have come out. And even Donna Brazil wrote something in um, the New York Times um, just this week about really understanding the position of power that the vice president is in and her ability to do things and get things done, but also the positioning for 2024. If we're really serious about reelecting President Biden and Vice President Harris, then having these kinds of comments going on these, you know, talk shows or podcasts or whatever you you want to call them, um, and making these kind of just blanket statements, they're not helpful. They're not helpful to the cause at large. And I'm so thankful for Reese and I commented on her, her post, and I, I shared it as well, about really calling out just incorrect, you know, commentary. And listen, Everyone is a commentary. I mean, everyone is a pundit these days. Everyone is able, because they have a cell phone, to really share their, their personal opinion about a number of topics. But what we're not all entitled to are the truth. We're not all entitled to the facts as they are. You know, so I appreciate this rebuttal in which every single thing that she said, Reese was able to go back find video, archive video, and really refute those claims and those statements. But unfortunately, I'm just not surprised that this is coming from Amanda. She's done this before, and unfortunately, she'll do it again. See, this is, this is why, Greg, um, I have, and again, in a previous interview when I was on The Breakfast Club, I said this. When I said, respect this. You have to respect the microphone. You have mm -hmm. to understand when you are the host of a show, I don't give a damn who comes on, 
that there are people who are listening to you. They're listening to a guest and they don't have access to the same facts. They don't have access to the data. And so there's a reason why if somebody comes on my show and says something like that or something else, I'm going to immediately fact check them because I don't want anybody listening to go away and say, well, they didn't say anything, so it must be correct. And then what happens is a clip gets played, it gets picked up, it gets amplifi amplified. And so when you try it, what Reese did or others, try to come back and then explain it, well, it doesn't get the same amount as, as, of heat as the original comment. And so therefore, the misinformation then gets sent around and folks believe that. That's why I'm always saying, don't play around with the microphone and the medium because it has power. Sorry. No, absolutely. Rolling. But I mean, we live in an idiocracy. Lowest <laughs> common denominator is what rules. Uh, of course, America, the United States of America is a racist country. It's racist to its core. It's a damn settler colonial state. It was built with anti-blackness as the core composite of, well, really whiteness, meaning anything that wasn't white, indigenous people, Africans, others, even many people who are now be considered white from the Irish to the Italians. You know, the whole thing is organized around race. And of course, Kamala Harris can never say that. So uh, the, simple, the simple fact of the matter is Amanda Seal has a brand. That brand mm. is competing with a brand like uh, Brother Lenard McKelvey, uh, who mm. named himself after someone who actually was over the Holy Roman Empire. Although if you put a gun to the head of every one of his listeners, they would all be have their brains blown out if you asked them to explain the uh, provenance of the phrase Charlemagne the God. But at any rate, when you go in a space like that, Roland, you have to balance. And you, again, conducted a class. And Reese, thank you again for walking through the facts. I agree with what Crystal said, laying out the facts. But when you go in a space like that, you know that the listeners could give a damn about facts. They're there for branding. Mm -hmm. They're there for entertainment. They're there for the gloss. And as Crystal said, you can't win a federal election for president or vice president. The closest you could get to call America a racist country or say we have a spiritual malaise is a Jimmy Carter, perhaps. You see how they then rent and reelected uh, Donald Trump the first, also known as Ronald Reagan, because he was trying to talk even a little bit of truth and he was a white man. The closest mm. you could get to call America a racist country is probably Lyndon Baines Johnson. And them days is gone. So at the end of the day, you you go into a space with a guy who calls himself Charlemagne the God, and you're trying to teach your audience, you did what you always do. Instead of just plastering the facts and coming with the data, since that doesn't matter in an idiocracy, you gave them three simple words to sort into categories, the last of which was very basic, and say that you can't go out there talking reckless. At that point, mm. the people who are there for the entertainment can grasp it. And that's all you can do in a space like that. Because, hell, Charlemagne be the damn president before long, if, if because this ain't about facts. This is about visibility and branding. Uh, mm. Folks, uh, again, so the, the Amanda Seals interview, that was with Jason Lee that was on Revolt. Uh, if you missed my Breakfast Club breakdown, just simply go to their YouTube channel. Uh, you can actually see it. Uh, again, uh, it was on yesterday. Uh, and look, it was all about uh, breaking these things down and walking people through, again, politics, stuff along those lines. But I'm going to say it again. We, you can offer a critique. You can have criticism. But you can't be reckless with comments because you have to understand that somebody's listening. Got to go to break. We come back. We're going to talk about the takeover of the Houston Independent School District by the state of Texas. Black elected officials are not happy at all. You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. A lot of these corporations or people that are running stuff push black people if they're doing a certain thing. What that does is it creates a butterfly effect of any young kid who, you know, wants to leave any situation they're in, and the only people they see are people that are doing this, so I gotta be a gangster, I gotta shoot, I gotta sell, I gotta do this in order to do it. And it just becomes a cycle, but when someone comes around and is making other Oh, money, we don't, you know. They don't wanna push it or put money into it, so. That's definitely something I'm trying to fix, too, is just show up as other avenues. You don't gotta be a rapper, you don't gotta be a ball player. You can be a country singer, you can be an opera singer, you can be a damn whatever, you know? Showing the, the different avenues, and that is possible, and it's hard for people to realize it's possible until someone does it.
on the next A Balanced Life with me, Dr. Jackie, Reentry Anxiety. A lot of us are having trouble transitioning in this post-pandemic society and don't even realize it. We are literally stuck between two worlds in purgatory. How to get out of purgatory and regain your footing and balance. What emotions they're feeling and being able to label them because as soon as you label an emotion, it's easier to self-regulate. It's easier to manage that emotion. The next A Balanced Life on Black Star Network. I'm Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, and my new show, Get Wealthy, focuses on the things that your financial advisor and bank isn't telling you, but you absolutely need to know. So watch Get Wealthy on the Black Star Network. I'm Chrisette Michelle. Hi, I'm Chaley Rose, and you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. Folks, the Texas Education Agency is now taking over the Houston Independent School District, which means they will be running all of the district's affairs, replacing the school superintendent, putting monitors in place of the Houston Independent School District board. This has been talked about for a number of years, and the trigger was pulled this week. Black elected officials are not happy about that. Mayor Sylvester Turner and others have spoken out against it. My next guest, Representative Jarvis Johnson, also is one of those folks as well. Glad to have you back on the show. Here's the thing here, Jarvis, that, that a lot of people who, do, who are not aware. First of all, this thing had been building for quite some time. Many people are saying, oh, this is Governor Greg Abbott taking it over. But a lot of this also went, went far back as when you had this schism on the board between Latino board members and black board members, when Granita Latham was a superintendent. Frankly, she should have been named superintendent, but the Hispanic board members did not want her in the job. They tried to hire a previous Hispanic superintendent. They, they had illegal board meetings, and that level of dysfunction really is what invited the TEA into this deal. So for a lot of, and then a lot of those same board members lost. So this thing has been very convoluted and has been building over a number of years. Well, that is very true. Um, and, but while uh, th there has been a rift between uh, board members and while there have been problem, problems with the board, I will say this, those, that board was duly elected by the people of the state of Texas. Uh, and because they were well, uh, of the city of Houston, and because they were duly elected, it is the responsibility of those uh, voters to then vote them out. And I think that is exactly what happened when they realized the mistake that was made. Uh, and so changes were made. And and um, but since then, the the before then, the governor didn't have a problem. And since then, the governor didn't have a problem. But now this year, uh, the governor has a problem, and the governor wants to use this opportunity to push his agenda to create vouchers and to destroy public education in the state of Texas. So um, what then is next? Because obviously, um, I mean, you're talking about a district that's majority black and brown. Um, and now we're talking about complete control. Also, this board was talking about a bond election coming up soon as well. But other districts have been taken over. The Wilmer Hutchins School District years ago uh, was taken over, no longer even exists, uh, in the Dallas area because of just rampant board dysfunction and academics there as well. The board, uh, TEA taking over a board has never been effective, ever. It has never worked. And currently right now, uh, HISD has a B-plus rating has no financial uh, uh, problems, has no fraud uh, involved. Um, the school that actually triggered uh, this takeover was Phyllis Wheatley High School. Um, since that time, a, a bill was actually put in place back in 2021 that gave a one-year um, time period by which Wheatley can come out of IR, uh, which is an unacceptable rating. And if they did, then that would stop the takeover. Well, Wheatley did that. They came out. They have a C-plus rating. Uh, and have done everything that they're supposed to do. TEA is proposing to take over HISD at the end of the year, which means there's a whole nother year of grading that will come out. And we obviously anticipate uh, the schools doing well again. So the question has to be, 
what are you taking over and for what purpose? Because if you're saying that you're here to for the protection of the students of HISD, well, the school is doing well. It's a B plus rated school and when uh, the school district. And when you look at HISD versus all of the other larger school districts, HISD does better than all of the other major larger districts in the state. So the question has to be, what are you trying to do? And the answer is only simple. Um, this is used as a uh, a scapegoat, and this is used as a test dummy for vouchers. This is used to make sure that they continue to attack Harris County, continue to attack the city of Houston, which are all democratically led city and ISD as well as county. So this is nothing more than a simple uh, um, usurp of government, usurp of, of law by simply saying we're going to do what we want to do. And yesterday, and I will quote uh, Mike Morath, who happens to be your frat brother, uh, I, I, I I, I digress, but I will say this. He said the law is different when it comes to Houston. And I asked for an explanation, but there was no explanation given. That's the problem with the state of Texas. They usurp the law. They're creating different laws for different people. Uh, and we see this over and over again. And this is going to put uh, the state of Texas in, in peril. I think this is obviously going to put HISD uh, in peril. And this is going to certainly help hurt all of our students uh, and our business community. Because who wants to relocate to a city uh, that does not have effectiveness? And let me just say this last thing about uh, HISD. Superintendent House that has gotten here uh, a little over a year ago was nominated as superintendent of the year, not in Texas, but the entire United States because of the turnaround that he has put in place for HISD, taking 50 schools from a D rating uh, to a C or above rating. Uh, and of those schools, uh, we only have uh, uh, seven schools that are in, in an unacceptable rating at this time. That's a tremendous t uh, uh, turnaround. And so they're on the right track. Uh, but the state of Texas wants to come in, TEA wants to come in and, and, and totally tear it down. And then they're going to point the finger and say, see, I told you Democrats don't know what they're doing. And now they're coming back to us and saying, well, who do you want to nominate uh, to be on uh, for board of managers? And again, these board of managers don't have to uh, have any experience, don't have to uh, have any knowledge, don't have to be involved or engaged, uh, just simply be um, donors or uh, political operative for for the Republican Party. So, uh, in terms of okay, so they're going to then take it over. Then what is now then going to be the response of black elected folks there in Houston? What is going to be the response uh, of parents? Uh, how are people going uh, to be engaged? Um, it, it, because again, if they're doing it, then there there has to be a counter response to it. The kind of response that I have said to all of my constituents, that I have said to the Texas Legislative Black Caucus, that we have to ask uh, our, our, we have to have meetings with our parents, with our students, with our business community to all stand tall. Because at the end of the day, um, without a plan, because there is no plan, there has been no mention of what will be done in the event that this takeover happens. There is not one plan that says this is what we're going to do. And so I'm asking and I'm demanding parents ask the question. And if that is the case, then they must stand tall and stand strong and stand on the line and said, I can't go to school unless and I think this has to be across the board. I can't go to school unless I know what's happening. Teachers are worried. We're already in a position where we're losing teachers at, at, at a at an unusual rate. Teachers are so uncertain. The administration is uncertain. Um, the police department is uncertain. And so we have to demand, and I think the only way we have to demand is that we stand on the line and say um, there won't be any school. There won't be uh, much learning going on uh, uh, unless they give a true plan for what is going to be done with this school. The school is already on, the district is already on the right uh, trajectory. Uh, and, and so there shouldn't be any interruption in that. But unfortunately, there is. I've talked with uh, Retha Thomas with HESP, uh, uh, with, which is the custodial workers, bus drivers, and so forth and so on. They're ready to stand up. Uh, we're talking with the teachers. Uh, teachers really want to stand up, but unfortunately, the state of Texas law prohibits them from, 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 um, from boycotting or, 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 or standing up the way they want to. But that doesn't stop them from wanting to, to do what I think is necessary to protect their jobs. Uh, and I've met with a lot of parents, and they're also saying the same thing, that it is time that, that they do something about this because they can't just sit by and watch uh, as their children are doing better and watch the school fall, the school district fall apart. So I, I think you're going to see a, um, a, a mass exodus 
versus um, people wanting to stand and, and for the uncertainty of what's going to happen to HISD. All right, but I Johnson. think that's by design. That's also by design that that they want this mass exodus because right now the governor is talking nothing but about vouchers. He's talking nothing about uh, oh we want to make sure that children have an opportunity of going to schools, good schools. Well, the voucher is only six thousand dollars, potentially seven. So there's no private schools in in, in Houston that's seven thousand dollars. So where is the parent going to find the additional ten to twenty thousand dollars to meet that gap? They won't find it unless they're already affluent enough to go to private schools. Right. So this is nothing more than a money grab for the for the affluent. All right. Representative Johnson, I appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thank you, brother. This point right here, uh, Crystal, is uh, what I've been sound the alarm of this show, uh, not just with this, but also Moms for Liberty, winning school board seats all across the South, uh, taking over those school boards, firing superintendents. When we are asleep at the wheel in school board races, we don't okay. understand the power of... Uh, who controls curriculum, who's controlling hiring, who's controlling these bond elections. We, people love spending so much time on the presidential or U.S. Senate race, but that school board is just as important. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, if this hasn't shown us anything, it shows that every single election matters, local elections matter, and it also matters who's in our schools, who's teaching our kids, who are the principals, who are the superintendents. And the thing that really struck me about what he just said was that the new superintendent has turned around the school district. And the way that, you know, Greg Abbott has rewarded, you know, his, his efforts is by really coming in and having this overreach by the state government. And that's something that is, is really hard to, it was hard to listen to the interview, although it was very informative, because really when you have a superintendent who's able to come in, turn around failing schools, bring them and uplift them, then all of a sudden it becomes an issue and there's this need for overreach. And when he talked about the seven the seven thousand dollar school voucher I agree with him. That's not enough to send a child to any private school and get a quote unquote better education. But again, this is something that, you know, the underlining premise is, you know, Greg Abbott and the state want control over this district, which is majority minority. 77% of the students there are Latino or identify as Latino, 22% are African American, 4% um, Asian, 11% white. And so why are they focusing on this one school? district across the entire state, which happens to be the largest, is because they want to control what students and what teachers are able to teach and what students are, are being taught in the schools. Uh, hold on one second. I got to go to a break. We come back. Uh, we'll get Reese and Greg's comments on this. You're watching Roller Martin Unfiltered right here on the Black Star Network. hatred on the streets, a horrific scene, a white nationalist rally that descended into deadly violence. Soil, you will not white people are losing their damn minds. As an angry pro-Trump mob storms the U.S. Capitol, we've seen shock. We're about to see the rise of what I call white minority resistance. We have seen white folks in this country who simply cannot tolerate black folks voting. I think what we're seeing is the inevitable result of violent denial. This is part of American history. Every time that people of color have made progress, whether real or symbolic, there has been what Carol Anderson at Emory University calls white rage as a backlash. This is the rise of the Proud Boys and the Boogaloo Boys. America, there's going to be more of this. Here's all the Proud Boys, guys. This country is getting increasingly racist in its behaviors and its attitudes because of the fear of white people. The fear that they're taking our jobs, they're taking our resources, they're taking our women. This is white fear. Coming up on the next Black Tape, a conversation with Professor Howard W. French on his new book, Born in Blackness, covering 600 years of global African history and helping us understand how the world we know today is a gift from Black people. There could have been no West without Africa and Africa. That's on the next Black Table with me, Greg Carr, only on the Black Star Network. Hi, I'm B.B. Winans. Hey, I'm Donnie Simpson. What's up? I'm Lance Gross, and you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered.
Welcome back to Roland Martin Unfiltered. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit that like button, folks, uh, as you're watching the show. Uh, Greg, education, education, education. For anybody who doesn't have any understanding, uh, black folks historically have understood this. That's one of the reasons why uh, those free people of African descent, when they got in the South Carolina legislature, uh, mm. they put it in the Constitution for there to be That's publicly financed education. Uh, and then when the white folks took over after uh, the Great Compromise of 1877, they threw all, all the advances out, but they kept that one in. Uh, and so education has always been paramount to us. And the reason I keep making this point about, it, about voting and what we do, these are, this, is, this is the result of what happens. The last election, 75, when Beto O'Rourke was running against Greg Abbott, 75% of young voters in Texas did not vote in the election. African Americans in, in Texas, Texas is 60% minority. 60% minority, yet 60% of people who vote in Texas are white. And so if anybody wants to talk about why there's a takeover, you have to understand those who are in power wield power. That's right, that's right. It reminds me of Cliff of Latosha and all those hours you spend on the road. You know, these battles are won door by door, life by life. Uh, black and brown people got together and put together in the Texas state legislature the 10 percent plan that allowed the top 10 percent of any high school uh, student and the top 10 percent of their class anywhere in the state of Texas to attend one of the public universities in Texas. And they also did that with poor white legislators. That's because it was in everybody's mutual interest, what Derrick Bell calls interest conversion, but uh, convergence. But what we see here is not just, and Crystal nailed this, of course, this is about a majority non-white school district, overwhelmingly majority white, non-white. But this shovel mouth bastard uh, governor of, uh, of Texas Abbott is after that budget as well. So I agree with Representative mm. Johnson. Uh, what's the budget in, in the school district, Houston Independent School District, Rome? About $2.2 billion, I think. Oh, Over it's two several billion, billion, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so this comes down to this. See, I, I worked for the school district of Philadelphia when it was taken over by the state of Pennsylvania, when Tom Ridge was the governor. This was 1998. And they, get, and they engaged in a game of chicken with the mayor of Philadelphia at the time, uh, um, um, John Street, a black man. And, and, the, and, and the soft takeover was something called the School Reform Commission. They were able then to get their hands on the budget of the school district of Philadelphia, at that time the fifth largest school district in the country. And they, were, they, and they tried to privatize it. They put Edison schools in. The folks, we all protested and organized. Jersey City, I think, was taken over by the state of New Jersey back in 19, uh, 1990, 1989. It just got control back in 2017. So it does happen, but I'll end with this. It's really disaster capitalism. Paul Vallis, mm -hmm. who's running for mayor of, of, of Chicago, he went down to New Orleans in 2007 because after Katrina, they turned the whole city of New Orleans school district into a charter school district. And that's when you can get at who buys the toilet paper, who puts the light bulbs in, who's got the budgets. This is a grab for the budget of the school district of Houston. And it is made easier, as Crystal said, because those children are other people's children. But make no mistake about it, these white boys after the money. Crystal? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, Reese. Uh, Reese. I'm sorry, Reese. You know, what I'm also thinking about, too, is connecting the dots between the Republican uh, power grabs around the country. If we look at what's happening with Tate Reeves down in there in Mississippi trying to take over the courts for Jackson, also obstructing um, federal money going to fix the lead water issue in Jackson. When we look at Br uh, Brian Kemp in Georgia trying to take the airport away from the city of Atlanta, if we look across the country, what we're seeing is Republicans trying to strip away the power and the Democratic enclaves of these Republican trifecta states. And so this is just a sample of what we have to look forward to as long as the Republicans have power and as long as they understand that as soon as Democrats exercise the capacity they have to vote, that they're going to be out on their ass, they're going to try to see how much they can get away with, how much they can, 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 can peel away from the Democrats in the state and then how they can take this nationwide. So I think that people should really be paying attention to how these Republicans are wielding power at the state level, but particularly how they're trying to strip your power away from you at the local level. Uh, and again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep saying this. And again, I, I don't understand um, why people are not getting it. When we are not maximizing our voting numbers, mm -hmm. we are putting our fate in somebody else's hands. <laughs> we cannot continue in these elections voting at 38, 40, 
42, 45, 48%. Uh, I don't have much time left, uh, but Crystal, if, and I keep saying it, this, I, I kept saying this on The Breakfast Club, if we are voting at 60, 65, 70, and 75% of our registered voters, we will be sweeping elections statewide. Mm hmm Absolutely. We, um, you know, every single advocacy group, organization, anyone who just cares about um, democracy or the black electorate, for that matter, needs to really impress upon voters why their vote matters. So many people, and I've heard this throughout the 2020 election cycle, and even now, there are so many people in this country who just don't vote. And then when things like this happen, then they're like, oh, shoulda, coulda, woulda, I don't understand, this is what they do. You know, you, you hear these, you know, this, the rhetoric, the talking points about why people don't vote, because they don't feel that people who are in elected office have their best interest in mind. But absolutely, in a, in a city or in a county like Harris County, where 77 percent of, the, of the, the children that go to or attend those school districts are minority. Really, it's, it's over 77 percent. It's more like 80-something percent. There should be that many people voting. And I, I wish I had the perfect answer on how we increase the amounts of people who vote. But until these kinds of things continue to happen more, I don't know that people will really realize that this is something that is systematically designed, the less you vote, the less power you have. And the more that we see white people voting, the more power that we're really just giving away to them to make these kind of crazy and right. drastic decisions. And, and again, uh, before I go, folks, again, quickly go to my iPad. Uh, voting turnout for black people in North Carolina was up 4% in 2020. Uh, it was 68%. Uh, Here was the problem, folks. The previous, in 2018, Sherry Beasley lost the chief Supreme Court justice seat by 400 votes. 400 votes. Now, why does that matter? Democrats could have had a 6 to 1 majority on the state Supreme Court. She loses. They had a 4 to 3 majority. In 2022, there was an election. Democrat lost. Republicans now they have regained the control of the state Supreme Court. Six months ago, the Supreme Court made a couple of rulings on racial uh, vo uh, uh, voter IDs and racial gerrymandering. Now the Republicans now control it. They're going to rehear those cases. So, folks, mm -hmm. again, 400 votes. If she had won 400 votes, mm -hmm. so go back to it. It says black voter turnout was up 4%, which means it was 64% in 2016, 68%. But if we actually, if it wasn't 64% in 2018, she wins. It's a different ball game. I just keep telling folks that's the way this whole thing goes. Uh, we have a shortened show because I am actually headed over to the Black Women's Roundtable, uh, their conference there. Uh, I'm going to be in conversation with Melanie Campbell uh, in 30 minutes, and so I'm headed over there now. Uh, let me thank Crystal, Reese, and Greg for being on today's show. Uh, what's going to happen, folks? Uh, we're going to go live uh, from there at 7:30, uh, and uh, so we'll be carrying that. So they've been meeting for the last couple of days. We've been streaming it on the Black Star Network. You you can see those restreams by going to our app or simply going to our 24-hour streaming channel as well. So, again, Crystal, Reese, and Greg, thank you so very much. Y'all be, be sure to check out Reese's show on Sirius XM on Saturday. I think she's going to have a couple more things to say about Amanda Seals and Vice President Kamala Harris. All right, folks, uh, yeah, don't forget to watch The Black Table with Greg Carr as well. All right, folks, thanks a bunch. I'll see y'all in 30 minutes right here on Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. We're all impacted by the culture, whether we know it or not. From politics to music and entertainment, it's a huge part of our lives, and we're going to talk about it every day right here on The Culture with me, Faraji Muhammad, only on the Black Star Network. A lot of these corporations or people that are running stuff push black people if they're doing a certain thing. What that does is it creates a butterfly effect of any young kid who, you know, wants to leave any situation they're in, and the only people they see are people that are doing this, so I gotta be a gangster, I gotta shoot, I gotta sell, I gotta do this in order to do it. And it just becomes a cycle, but when someone comes around and is making other, oh, we don't, you know, they don't wanna push it or put money into it, so. That's definitely something I'm trying to fix, too, is just show there's other avenues. You don't gotta be a rapper, you don't gotta be a ball player. You can be a country singer, you can be an opera singer, you can be a damn whatever, you know? Showing the, the different avenues, and that is possible, and it's hard for people to realize it's possible until someone does it. We 
talk about blackness and what happens in black culture, we are about covering these things that matter to us, uh, speaking to our issues and concerns. This is a genuine people-powered movement. There's a lot of stuff that we're not getting. You get it, and you spread the word. We wish to plead our own cause to long have others spoken for us. We cannot tell our own story if we can't pay for it. This is about uh, covering us. Invest in black-owned media. Your dollars matter. We don't have to keep asking them to cover our stuff. So please support us in what we do, folks. We want to hit 2,000 people, $50 this month, raise $100,000. We're behind 100000 so we want to hit that. Y'all money makes this possible. Checks and money orders go to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037 dash. 0196. The cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zelle is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. Hey, I'm Donnie Simpson. What's up? I'm Lance Gross, and you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. The family of former NFL cornerback Stanley Wilson Jr. believes law enforcement beat him before he died at a California mental hospital. Wilson, a former Detroit Lion, died on February 1st after officials initially reported that he collapsed and fell from a chair. The family filed three wrongful death claims against Los Angeles County, one on behalf of each of his parents, Stanley Wilson Sr. and Dr. Poulain Lucas, and another on behalf of his estate, asking for $45 million in damages. Wilson's family revealed photos of his body showing marks on his head that appear to show he was stomped and scarred indicate that he was handcuffed. Wilson was admitted to the Twin Towers Correctional Facility in August after he was in declared incompetent to stand trial on vandalism charges. Wilson's family believed he may have suffered from CTE. Autopsy results have not been released. I'm going to go back to the panel on this. Dr. Carr is still with us, as well as Crystal Knight. You know what um, is so crazy about all about this story is that this kind of stemmed from vandalism charges. And so we had a person who was suffering for some kind of mental health issues in a in a in a facility that's not just a regular mental health hospital, but actually like an incarceral mental health facility. And this is the fallout. Dr. Carr, what do you have to say about how this has escalated from the point of vandalism charges to his ultimate death. Well, we know, we know, sisters, that, you know, being black in this country is, you know, we're born at risk. And this is just another example of violence. And one of the reasons I was a little late today, um, my students helped me over up at Howard. My friend Jelani Cobb just published an article in The New Yorker on the 50-year anniversary of hip-hop. And he talks about the fact that while everybody loves hip-hop, Black people are out in the streets dying. And he says the simple fact of the matter is that all of our culture speaks to this desire to live just a little bit longer, because we all going to die. This brother was a professional athlete, trying to make a way for his family, trying to you know make a better life for himself, and had a career-ending injury, and ends up a victim of state violence. Now, whether it's high blood pressure, diabetes, or any number of things that take our lives, inf um, infant mortality, any things that take our lives, or in this case, abuse by the state after abuse by the sport you're playing just to get ahead. This is another example of the risks of being black in America and trying to extend your life a little bit longer. And this is sometimes what happens, too often what happens. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, if you think about it, the mental health facility is where you're supposed to heal, not where you're supposed to actually die. So the circumstances surrounding this, being in handcuffs, being stomped, which is brut brutality, uh, it's just inexcusable. Crystal, what's your take on this one? Yeah, this story is is sad. I mean, it's it's sad to hear. I hope that, you know, more of the details surrounding his death actually come out. Um, but, you know, I agree with what Dr. Carr said. You know, black men are not living to see 60. I mean, probably even less than that. You know, just thinking about all of the black death that we've seen over the last couple of years. And again, if this is someone who was crying out for help, who needed help to seek it, get treated, and then die, 
the circumstances surrounding that um, are very murky at best. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I want answers for it. I think his family deserves to understand exactly what happened. And ultimately, I want people in our um, hospitals, care facilities, um, police officers to see black bodies as worthy, because when they do, they won't take, you know, actions that ultimately will, will lead to our demise. And that's actually, that's what I'm, I'm guessing that's what happened um, is that people, you know, don't don't see black bodies as valuable in this country. And so when something um, happens that's negative or something that is life altering happens, instead of helping, people just continue to exacerbate the problem to the point of death. Mm -hmm. You're so right. And we've seen cases, we've covered it on the show, where, for instance, with uh, Tyree Nichols, where he was not administered the proper medical care. We've seen it with other uh, cases where the paramedics show up and they don't do what they're supposed to do. You know, what's right. very uh, interesting, though, is when we talk about police brutality, when we talk about um, the, the, the criminal justice system, often the mental health hospitals, mental health professionals are put up as an alternative to uh, policing itself um, mm. as though that would make us safer. And here is a case where we see that even if you and if you inject any kind of carceral aspect to it, it seems to have the same result. What do you think, Dr. Carr? No, I agree. Absolutely. I mean, again, I mean, the fact that this was a junior uh, you know, mm -hmm. meaning his parents, his father has to, I mean, you know, it just, it, I mean, it's just the way that, Crystal, I think the way you laid it out, again, is there. We are not human. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, the fact that you sustain the type of injury that could shorten your life anyway, and then you call out for help. And as you said, Reese, th this is supposed to provide, mental health facilities are supposed to provide help. And they do for human beings. But if mm -hmm. you're not a human, then then you won't receive anything other than brutality there. So, I mean, again, it, our fundamental problem is the challenge. And this is for men, women, children, all of us as African people. Sandra Bland, after all, in a cell where they say she killed herself, why well, she should never have been halted in the first place. Our challenge is to navigate this funky place that we're in. It cannot mm -hmm. be saved in its current form. It's going to have to be remade because it has never seen us as human, and it will never see us as human. We're going to have to win that respect by first respecting ourselves enough. Maybe we need some more black mental health facilities and some more elected officials to be run management over the ones that treat our people like this. Right, right. Well, the we have to go to a break in a second, but one thing I just want to say is what's interesting is the CTE aspect. And so an autopsy has not been performed yet. I'm interested to see when that is performed, if there if that played any kind of role in it. But we have to take a break. We'll be right back with more Rolla Martin Unfiltered here on the Black Star Network. People that are running stuff push black people if they're doing a certain thing. What that does is it creates a butterfly effect of any young kid who, you know, wants to leave any situation they're in, and the only people they see are people that are doing this, so I gotta be a gangster, I gotta shoot, I gotta sell, I gotta do this in order to do it, and it just becomes a cycle, but when someone comes around and is making other oh, money, we don't, money, you know, they don't wanna push it or put money into it, so that's definitely something I'm trying to fix, too, is just show up, there's other avenues. You don't gotta be a rapper, you don't gotta be a ball player, you can be a country singer, you can be an opera singer, you can be a damn whatever, you know? You know, showing the, the different avenues, and that is possible, and it's hard for people to realize it's possible until someone does. When you talk about blackness and what happens in black culture, we're about covering these things that matter to us, uh, speaking to our issues and concerns. This is a genuine people-powered movement. There's a lot of stuff that we're not getting. You get it, and you spread the word. We wish to plead our own cause to long have others spoken for us. We cannot tell our own story if we can't pay for it. This is about uh, covering us. Invest in Black-owned media. Your dollars matter. We don't have to keep asking them to cover our stuff. So please support us in what we do, folks. We want to hit 2,000 people, $50 this month, raise $100,000. We're behind 100000 so we want to hit that. Y'all money makes this possible. Checks and money orders go to PO Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037 dash 
0196. The cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zell is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. This is Judge Matthews. What's going on, everybody? It's your boy, Mac Wiles, and you are watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. A former activist is blasting San Francisco's reparations plan as gaslighting Black Americans. Xavier DeRoso, who claims to be an ex-BLM supporter, appeared on Fox News' The Ingram Angle to discuss how the plan falsely promotes systemic racism after San Francisco's Board of Supervisors embraced 111 recommendations made by a city-appointed reparations committee. Now is Xavier De Rousseau, a former BLM activist turned Prager U personality. Xavier, great to see you tonight. Um, you have an interesting perspective on this debate. Explain. Yes, I think it's important that, first of all, we call this exactly what it is. This is 111 ways to gaslight black Americans into thinking that we need to be dependent on a system of handouts in order to be successful. Black Americans have been indoctrinated with these lies for far too long, and I used to fall for the lies until I took a deep dive into the videos on PragerU.com and realized how easily debunked these fraudulent narratives surrounding systemic racism actually are. The plan included lump sum payments of $5 million to every eligible black citizen, guaranteed incomes of $97,000 per year for 250 years, elimination of personal debt and tax burdens, and homes for just $1. The San Francisco Reparations Committee will continue to deliberate recommendations. Its final report is due to the legislature on July 1st. Now, I have thoughts about this program, these recommendations. Uh, first of all, um, financially, I just don't even see how it's feasible at all. So I would tend to agree with the idea of gaslighting in the sense that it's probably never going to happen. But Xavier made a quite different point. Uh, Dr. Carr, what is your take on this reparations plan? Well, we can start with uh, Dennis Prager's scam, also known as Prager University an unaccredited place that shows videos. And so I think that uh, anything after that, as soon as she had, uh, uh, announced him and identified him as affiliated with uh, Prager University, the next thing should have been, as he started talking. Oh, wait. Oh, you couldn't uh -oh. hear me. Yeah, in other words, the mute should have gone on at that point. But <laughs> since we're talking about this, uh, in, in, a, in an instance, it reminds me of something Minister Farrakhan back in the 80s, he gave a, he, he went on tour around the country when they were engendering this notion of selling products, lotion and soap. It's called Power It Lasts Forever. And in Atlanta, he gave a speech where the refrain he kept returning to was, figure it up, count it up. Mm. And he started mm -hmm. saying, it, it, they took the whole country, count that up. Okay. Then they murdered all the Native Americans. Count that up. Then they brought us over here by the millions. Count that up. And then he kept going, everybody. And finally, in, he said, if you figure it up, you'll find out that they we they owe us the whole damn country, and we're not even asking for that. See, the exercise of making this concrete, whether you ever get a dime or not, is to mm. describe the enormity of the debt, whether you ever get a penny or not. Now, what this fool is doing, yassa, talking to this white nationalist who has no problem engendering all kind of propaganda from her perch as she tweets her and texts her buddies over there, fellow anchors, saying, I know they're crazy as hell, but we can't mess with the money and the ratings. We have to understand that this is a propaganda war. This is a propaganda mm -hmm. war. San Francisco ain't got the kind of money to cut that kind of check, but when you think of the enormity of the harm, it can in many ways remind us that not only are we owed, but we are at the foundation of this thing called the United States of America. And of course, when it comes back, they can adjust any of the 111. There are going to be things on there that they probably will pass. Mm -hmm. Well, genius, of course, and a whole sermon there, Dr. Carr. I think you make such a great point about the at least uh, moral victory of of of. of putting such a high number on something that's really um, invaluable or priceless. Uh, but Crystal, what's your take, though, in terms of if you want to move beyond a moral victory into actual payments, into actual tangible results, do you think that the numbers being put out there is something that puts us closer to that? Or do you think that's something that 
kind of blows it out of the water as anything being feasible? Well, I think that there are challenges with the number that is proposed. My take on, you know, the whole proposal is that we have to start somewhere. I tend to agree with Dr. Carr that, you know, regardless of if it's too big or even too small, um, getting it through, getting something actually passed, to me, is more important. And then you can go back and work on the numbers. You know, I don't think that it, this will pass, you know, in, in actuality, but I do think that we need to have the conversation. We need to normalize having um, city councils or county commissions or, you know, state governments really discuss and talk about reparations across this country. Right now, we've seen it. It's sparse. It's here and there. It's in California. There have been some in Illinois, maybe another or two in other places. But even at the federal level, we haven't taken up reparations to even study it at the federal level. And so mm -hmm. I think that, you know, if we are serious about paying back the debts of our ancestors who have built this country for free, who were brought over here against our will, whatever the, the first step is, we have to get there. We have to get through whatever this first piece. No one will ever be fully satisfied with the number or the items um, that are being suggested. But if we continue to tear down even the process of just having the conversation, getting a first read, getting something passed, we will forever be in this revolving cyclical door about something not being enough or not or, or something being too much. Mm -hmm. That's true, Crystal. But to your point, I mean, about the, nece the how necessary it is to have a conversation and to start somewhere, I can't say that I've seen a lot of in-person engagement around this. Now, granted, I'm not in San Francisco. I'm not in California. Am I missing something? And Dr. Carr, you can weigh in too, because you obviously were part of the statewide um, study or initiative behind this. Is there an on the ground where we talk about things like civic engagement, going to your school board meetings, going to your county meetings? Has there been a galvanization around this on the ground from in the same way that we hear about it online if people are in the YouTube chats? Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. In fact, the first major effort to organize African people of reparations in this country goes back to the 19th century. A sister named Callie House and Isaiah Dickerson, the ex-slave mutual relief and pension fund. These were Africans who had actually gone through enslavement, who demand, made a demand of the federal government. Uh, so it starts in the 1880s and 1890s, and it's really an unbroken string. In the 1920s, 30s, Queen Mother Audley Moore. By the 1960s, you're talking about the Republic of New Africa. Um, you're talking about Chokwe Lumumba, the father of the current mayor of Jackson. That's how they ended up mm -hmm. in Jackson, in the first place from Detroit. Mm -hmm. and, and there's the National Coalition of Blacks for Reparations in America, founded, uh, began in 1989 to bring those groups together. And of course, as, as Chris just said, there's H.R. 40, which John Conyers in, began introducing 40 years ago. And now, of course, Sheila Jackson Lee has taken it up. It's an unbroken string. The only other thing I would say is that there are local reparations movements. There have been resolutions passed in cities like Philadelphia. There's obviously what's going on mm -hmm. in the northern mm -hmm. suburbs of Chicago, the Evanston work. Um, so there's an unbroken thing. And finally, what you said, uh, Reese, and you always remind us of this in terms of this question of social media, particularly weaponized ignorance. There's an in, there's this uh, descendants of enslavement uh, conversation going on. All that's local, and there's a lot of people organizing around it. I do not agree with the California framework in terms of this notion of only those who were enslaved in the United States, descended of them, can get reparations. But I do think it's important that the momentum has now taken up again. So no, there's an unbroken string of this demand. And like Crystal said, you gotta put something on the table. Once that is established, then we begin the negotiations. But until you make that demand, you know, we, we just basically are talking to each other. Well, I agree with you. I definitely agree. I, I think that there's a, a rich legacy of this kind of local activism. I'm just curious how much of that local advocacy is paired up with or how proportional it is to oh. people purporting to actually care about this issue when you look at the kind of volume of traffic that you have online. Can't yes. say I've seen that proportion of interest on the ground. But again, I could be missing something. What do you think, no. Crystal? Oh, you're not. No. Um, I 
I don't know that I've seen. So when I'm and when I think about this issue, I want to just, you know, compare it to voting rights. So if we think about when President Biden took office, we heard national advocacy organizations. We heard even the DNC talking about, you know, the need to pass um, the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, the need to, you know, get voting rights really and truly codified um, or really and truly, you know, just immersed in our um, American voting electorate system. I don't hear this same resounding voice um, from national groups and even local groups or state-based groups. Now, that's not to say, as Dr. Carr stated, that there aren't people out here talking about it. But I don't think that reparations is a true agenda item every single year by advocacy organizations, big and small. And until it becomes this resounding thing, if we talk about reparations the way we talk about people registering to vote, we could probably get somewhere. We talk about registering to vote every single year. It is critical that you register to vote. It's critical that you use your voice. It's critical that you do all these things. We just had a segment on that with, with Roland about, you know, Texas. But if we talk about reparations in the same light and with the same weight that we talk about these other civil rights issues, then I think when we hear this narrative, when you, you talk about, you know, the narrative in the media, it is not talked about enough. So it's not that people don't care about it. It's just not enough people care about it collectively all at the same time. And so that's what I, that's my perspective about it is that I think people, yes, everyone, I haven't really heard anyone say, I don't want reparations, but I haven't seen <laughs> right. people run a year round campaign about preparation, about reparations, excuse me, in the same manner and that they run these year round campaigns about voting rights, voter registration, or any other issue that they really care about. Mm hmm well, I, I absolutely agree with you, but and to be clear, I mean, this Xavier person talked about not wanting reparations because it's a handout. Reparations is not a handout. It's a repayment for the unspeakable horrors that have been inflicted on us. And so to your point, Crystal, yeah, you're right. There has not been the same kind of resounding voice behind that, but Look at how much begging we've had to do just to get people at 30% turnout. And this is people who are already registered to vote. We're not even talking people who aren't even registered to vote. And so mm -hmm. where do we go from here? I don't know. But it definitely seems like at least San Francisco is, is serious about evaluating this. What ultimately, what kind of check gets cut? And I haven't even heard the details around what eligibility looks like but if you if you have anybody that came through San Francisco, now might be a good time to get your paperwork together. <laughs> it might be a good time if you are in San Francisco to register to vote on whatever the criteria, pay your taxes, do your tax return, file for residency, something. Because that's right. That's right. Now, but no, San Francisco, but Risa, oh, go ahead. Sorry. I know no, 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 I know we I know we we're gonna go to break in a second, but I do wanna stress the fact that the fact that we're having this conversation, when you look back over the full arc of the reparations movement, this really is progress. Reparations has typically been a cause okay. that has been championed by black nationalists and pan-Africanists. The fact that we are now having this conversation, you know, Tanasi Coates' article in the Atlantic years ago, before that, Randall Robinson's 2000 book called The Debt. The fact that we're even doing it now, that the California state legislature appointed a committee, the largest state in the country, headed in the legislature by a black woman who is a retired professor of African American studies. When you measure the movement of the, the 90s, 80s, 70s, 60s, all the way back to the 19th century to now, this is a quantum leap. So I, I, I think we should always, you know, not just where, we, where we're going, but measure where we're against where we've been. This was something the Black Panthers used to bring up, us used to bring up, the Pan-Africanists used to bring up, political prisoners used to bring up. And now it's stuff that's being discussed by white nationalists like Laura Ingram because it can't be ignored anymore. That's progress. Mm. Right. I'm not asked right, Dr. Carr. I mean, quantum leap is not a word you hear a lot because we live in an instant gratification society. Yes. But yes. You, when you put it in the context, this is radical, drastic progress, even That's if right. it's not at the finish line yet. Well, right. we have to wrap up. We're going to go to the Black Women's Roundtable that, uh, that uh, Roland will be moderating at. Crystal Knight, Democratic strategist, thank you so much for being here. Dr. Greg Carr, always good to be with you. Y'all check out the Black Table tomorrow. And I'm Risa <laughs> Cobra signing out for Roller Martin Unfiltered, this part. Bye, y'all.
Bye. Thank you. See ya. Streets, a horrific scene. A white nationalist rally that descended into deadly violence. White people are losing their damn minds. An angry pro Trump mob storms the U.S. Capitol. We're about to see the rise of what I call white minority resistance. We have seen white folks in this country who simply cannot tolerate black folks voting. I think what we're seeing is the inevitable result of violent denial. This is part of American history. Every time that people of color have made progress, whether real or symbolic, there has been what Carol Anderson at Emory University calls white rage as a backlash. This is the rise of the Proud Boys and the Boogaloo Boys. America, there's going to be more of this. Here's all the Proud Boys, guys. This country is getting increasingly racist in its behaviors and its attitudes because of the fear of white people. The fear that they're taking our jobs, they're taking our resources, they're taking our women. This is white fear. A lot of these corporations or people that are running stuff push black people if they're doing a certain thing. What that does is it creates a butterfly effect of any young kid who, you know, wants to leave any situation they're in, and the only people they see are people that are doing this, so I gotta be a gangster, I gotta shoot, I gotta sell, I gotta do this in order to do it. And it just becomes a cycle, but when someone comes around and is making other, oh, we don't, you know, they don't wanna push it or put money into it, so. That's definitely something I'm trying to fix, too, is just show there's other avenues. You don't gotta be a rapper, you don't gotta be a ball player. You can be a country singer, you can be an opera singer, you can be a damn whatever, you know? Showing the, the different avenues, and that is possible, and it's hard for people to realize it's possible until someone does it. On the next Get Wealthy with me, Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach. The studies show that millennials and Gen Xers will be less well off than their parents. What can we do to make sure that we get to children younger and that they have the right money habits? Well, joining me on the next Get Wealthy is an author who's created a master playbook. Be willing to share some of your money mistakes, right? If that's what, if that's what you have to lean on, um, start with the money mistakes that you have made, but don't just tell the mistake, right? Tell the lesson in the mistake. That's right here on Get Wealthy, only on Black Star Network. We talk about blackness and what happens in black culture. We're about covering these things that matter to us, uh, speaking to our issues and concerns. This is a genuine people-powered movement. There's a lot of stuff that we're not getting. You get it, and you spread the word. We wish to plead our own cause too long have others spoken for us. We cannot tell our own story if we can't pay for it. This is about uh, covering us. Invest in Black-owned media. Your dollars matter. We don't have to keep asking them to cover our stuff. So please support us in what we do, folks. We want to hit 2,000 people, $50 this month, raise $100,000. We're behind 100000 so we want to hit that. Y'all money makes this possible. Check some money orders. Go to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037- 0196. The cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zelle is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. Hatred on the streets. A horrific scene. A white nationalist rally that descended into deadly violence. You will not white people are losing their damn minds. An angry pro Trump mob storms the U.S. Capitol. We're about to see the rise of what I call white minority resistance. We have seen white folks in this country who simply cannot tolerate black folks voting. I think what we're seeing is the inevitable result of violent denial. This is part of American history. Every time that people of color have made progress, whether real or symbolic, there has been what Carol Anderson at Emory University calls white rage 
as a backlash. This is the rise of the Proud Boys and the Boogaloo Boys. America, there's going to be more of this. Here's all the Proud Boys, guys. This country is getting increasingly racist in its behaviors and its attitudes because of the fear of white people. The fear that they're taking our jobs, they're taking our resources, they're taking our women. This is white fear. A real uh, revolutionary right now. Black Power. We support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. Uh, thank you for being the voice of Black America, Roller. Hey, Black, I love y'all. All momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black owned media and be skate. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? Pull up a chair, take your seat. The Black Tape with me, Dr. Greg Carr, here on the Black Star Network. Every week, we'll take a deeper dive into the world we're living in. Join the conversation only on the Black Star Network. Hi, I'm Dr. Jackie Hood Martin, and I have a question for you. Ever feel as if your life is teetering and the weight and pressure of the world is consistently on your shoulders? Well, let me tell you, living a balanced life isn't easy. Join me each Tuesday on Black Star Network for a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. We're all impacted by the culture, whether we know it or not. From politics to music and entertainment, it's a huge part of our lives. And we're going to talk about it every day right here on The Culture with me, Faraji Muhammad, only on the Black Star Network. Owens, America's Wealth Coach, and my new show, Get Wealthy, focuses on the things that your financial advisor and bank isn't telling you what you absolutely need to know. So watch Get Wealthy on the Black Star Network. Hatred on the streets, a horrific scene, a white nationalist rally that descended into deadly violence. White people are losing their damn minds. As an angry pro Trump mob storms the U.S. Capitol, we're about to see the rise of what I call white minority resistance. We have seen white folks in this country who simply cannot tolerate black folks voting. I think what we're seeing is the inevitable result of violent denial. This is part of American history. Every time that people of color have made progress, whether real or symbolic, there has been what Carol Anderson at Emory University calls white rage as a back. This is the rise of the Proud Boys and the Boogaloo Boys. America, there's going to be more of this. Here's all the Proud Boys, guys. This country is getting increasingly racist in its behaviors and its attitudes because of the fear of white people. The fear that they're taking our jobs, they're taking our resources, they're taking our women. This is white fear. Bye -bye, Papa. I'm Dion Cole, and you're watching. Roland Martin, unfiltered. Stay woke. We will discuss here today as the nation's most engaged and reliable voting bloc. But who is that? Black, Black women. 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 Say, so who is that? Black women. We have the power to affect change. Say, we have the power. We have the power. We know that when Black women show up to the polls, we not only vote for ourselves, but for our families and communities, as I stated, and this nation. We have said, see how many times, Every over. Time. over, and, over. And, over. and our democracy over. needs saving yes. once again. So we're here today to walk these halls of Congress, to walk these halls at the U.S. Senate, most specifically today, because we have to make sure that our children 
Uh, here we have high schools. Uh, who here from, from high schools today? Right? I know a bunch from Alabama and other states are here today. And so they're here to, to learn from us, but also t t tell their U.S. senator, and some will go to Congress House offices to meet with staffers, but to remind them why we sent them here. And, this, and, 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 and here's a, a focus for us. Our priority issues are to make sure they pass a fair budget. Say pass a fair budget. Pass a fair budget. Protect our rights. Protect our rights. And freedoms. And freedoms. We're about making sure you protect workers' rights. Workers' rights. And make sure that all of our communities are safe with fair public safety policy. I'm going to say it again. We want our communities safe with safe public safety policy, safe. not to just lock our folks up. We are here to deal with the issues of privacy. We're here to talk about and demand that they protect the safety net. And what is that? That's Medicare, that's Medicaid, that's Social Security. That's making sure that when you talk about having, not to have to, what to say, take care of our medicine, low cost, of taking care of having to pay for medicine, yeah. not have to make choices right. of whether you can eat yeah. or whether you can take care and get the medicine you need. We're here about criminal justice and giving second first chance. and second, second chances. Chance. Right. Right? right? Around that, around criminal justice reform. And, 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 and at the end of the day, when we talk about second chances, we're talking about making sure that we pour into folks so that they have an opportunity to thrive in this country. And we're talking about economic security and prosperity in this nation as our priority. So this time, I will bring on some of our national partners. I'm going to call your name and you come uh, in this order. Our sister Clayola Brown, president, yeah. national president yeah. of A. Philip Randolph Institute. But she, like a lot of sisters, got to wear two or three hats because they need her so much. She also is the special assistant uh, around strategic partnerships and alliances. Did I mess that up? You got it. Um, <laughs> uh, for, <laughs> she helped make sure they do right, right? With community and, and, and partner up with all of us, with AFL-CIO. Uh, then you will hear from our sister leader, Sheena Me, yeah. who is the CEO of Clean Slate Initiative. <laughs> okay, of the Clean Slate Initiative, but also has been with us for uh 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 years from Black You Vote <laughs> On, and we're so there. proud. I, you don't have to tell mine, I'll tell yours. Uh, so we know we'll leave that alone, right? Thank you, thank you. Um, and see the mead, and then we'll hear from uh, who will talk about not just criminal justice reform, but about second chances and what yeah. all that means for all of our communities. And Dr. Elsie Scott, who's the founding director of the Ronald Walters Leadership yeah. and Public Policy yeah. Center. At, and I say this, I don't want to hear this. Howard University, just act like y'all didn't hear me from Howard. <laughs> Ain't you? Okay, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, Ain't you, you know. H right, H right. <laughs> uh, and then we will uh, hear from our senator, hopefully, and then we will hear from our some of our, st our, our state leaders uh, and young leaders uh, to talk about why they're here as a part of this coalition. Clayola, okay. Sheena, Dr. L. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. You have to be dedicated to get up and put on your go get them shoes to come and make sure that your voice gets heard. So I say congratulations to you before you meet with anybody this morning. You met with yourself. You met with your dignity. You met with the pride that comes with being a black woman. Yeah. Our leader, Melanie Campbell, said that black women have saved this country. Yes, we have. Yeah. And we go keep doing it because if we don't stand up for ourselves, nobody else will do it for us. Yeah. Now, let me tell you this. Workers' rights is tied in with all of these pieces that we're talking about. Because if there's anything a black woman knows about, it's what it is to be a worker and 900 other things at the same daggone time. I'm going to try real good and I ain't going to cuss this morning, Melanie. <laughs> <laughs> but if we take a look at some of the legislation that's being provided, and I say provided because they didn't ask us nothing, right? Right. You have to read two times to make sure that you up in there. Right. All right. I am not a PhD, so you're going to hear what comes out of South Carolina. Okay. Listen close so that you don't miss it. But workers' rights goes way beyond just the ones that are people who are going into a shop or a plant or whatever. If you get up every day and you go and meet the
cause for providing for your family or having the right to make a choice about your life and what you do with your own body, you are a worker in the movement of being protective of yourself and your dignity. Amen. So when we talk to these legislators, let them know that we are not a one trick pony. Not one issue is gonna satisfy anybody. All of the signs that you see that talk about the pride of our family, about the dignity of work, all of those things are a part of who we are as black women. Don't go in there being proper. Go in there being yourself. Yeah. It's their job to know the number of the bill. It's their job to know how it ties to particular legislation. But it's your job to let the legislators that represent you know that you are paying attention. Yeah. And that's why when Melanie say we're coming on point, when we're talking, we're talking from our heart and our history. Don't let that be anything fancy for you. Just be yourself. They understand that there is no question about honesty, about truth, and about dignity. And black women got all of that. So we're going to show them that today as we do our walk. Thank you very much, Melanie, for the two seconds. I'm done. <laughs>
one out of two children have a parent with a record. And when we say, you know, we're, we're about civic engagement, bringing people to the table, bringing people to the voting booth. But what happens when they shut out? How do we ask people to show up for our community when they can't show up for work because they can't get a job? When they can't show up for their children because they're not allowed to go to the school on a field trip? When they can't get a career because they're excluded from 44,000 occupations and, and certificates? We need to tell Congress to act today and pass clean slate and give a pathway for people to clear their records. Because we can't build back better if we're leaving people behind. Let me let you know, we can't build back better when we're leaving 70 to 100 million people behind. And so as you go up there today, we're asking people to share your stories in the field. Let people know that there are people that is, that is behind that could not be here with us today because they're out there searching for a job. They're trying to figure out how they can show up for the community and their children because they have a record. And we're not going to leave them behind. Are we going to leave them sisters behind? No. Are we going to leave them brothers behind? No. So I'm asking y'all to show up and show out and talk about the Clean Slate Act and tell Congress that they need to create a pathway. Tell our administration when y'all go to the White House that we cannot build back better when we're leaving 70 million people behind. Thank Amen. you. Amen. 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 Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I am Elsie Scott. I'm here uh, with the Black Women's Roundtable, with the National Coalition on Civic Black Civic Participation. And we are just happy that we have a good turnout of women today, a good turnout of young women today. And when you go to the Senate today, speak with your senators, and if some of you go on the House side and speak with the House staff, we need to emphasize that criminal justice reform is very important in the lives of black people in this country. We have been brutalized by the criminal justice system. We have, we have been the victims of poor policing. We've been the victims of aggressive policing. We've been the victim of over-incarceration. We've been the victim of sentencing acts that sent us to prison for longer times. So we want to talk about reform. It's when George Floyd was killed, we thought we were going to see some action here in Congress. We had the George Floyd Policing Act passed on the House side, but it didn't pass on the Senate side. We got to continue to push for police reform. And I can speak about that because I have done both sides of the policing. I have served as a deputy commissioner for the New York City Police Department and tried to reform from the inside. But I've also been an active on, activist on the outside trying to push for police reform. So policing is a local function, but the federal government has a lot of bringing about change in police departments. We can't just let small 20-person police departments do what they want to do, not observe the proper laws, not train their police officers properly, not select people who don't have bad records, criminal records. So there are things at the federal level we can put in standards in order to force all police departments to clean up their act, to select people that should be policing us to, to get rid of people who should not be on the police department in the first time. Amen. Because there's people that cannot be trained. We can talk about police training, but I used to run training programs. But there are some people who should not be in the police department in the first place. So no amount of training is going to stop them from brutalizing communities. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time, uh, but I do have to mention, since we're talking about women, we have to talk about domestic violence. Yes. Violence against women. Yes. Yes. We must look at how we can get the system to fight for women who are being brutalized. Because we talked, as we talked yesterday, is that many women now they have given up on the system helping them with domestic violence. We are turning to our sisters as the first responders instead of police departments. But we have to get mental health services into our cities to help black women who are being brutalized in their homes, by their spouses, by their boyfriends. But this is one of the main areas that I want to leave you with. All right. All right. Thank you, Elsie. Uh, she got receipts. Say receipts. Right. <laughs> you know, she's very humble about what she knows when it comes to public safety. Uh, Elsie, am I correct? Were you the executive director of NOBO? Yes. You know, the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Execs. 
Uh, what you do in New York? <laughs> Deputy Commission of Training. <laughs> Give me New York City. Yeah, so she not just talking. Qualified. She didn't walk it. Qualified. Thank you, my sister. Um, I heard that the senator is here. Is that correct? Not yet. Um, but I do know uh, Vince Evans was here from the Executive Director of Congressional Black Caucus. If he could walk up here. Where's he at? Where's he at? One more push your hand. Uh, yes, I'm from Mississippi. No, Florida. You from Florida? He's even more, even more home tra training. Exactly. Act like he don't know when when, when, when grown exactly. folks say, "Come on, come on." <laughs> right. He just was just ignoring me, y'all. Okay, we go. Thank you. Come on up here for for thank us. You. Um, you you. Represent Good morning, everybody. <laughs> Listen, I learned a long time ago. You do what Melanie Campbell tells you to do. She told me to be here on behalf of the Congressional Black Caucus and our members who are obviously home in their districts today, the 58 members of the CBC. Let me publicly say first what we say privately to Melanie Campbell, which is thank you. I have seen these past couple of years here on Capitol Hill and in the White House. I've seen Melanie Campbell in rooms where there are cameras and rooms where there are no cameras. Melanie Campbell is the same in private as she is in public. She's a fierce fighter and a defender. So let's give her a round of applause. I want to thank the uh, Black Women's Roundtable for your leadership. I will not repeat all the issues that you have heard, from a p police accountability and public safety to voting rights to equal pay for uh, uh, equal, uh, equal days pay for equal days work for women, women's health rights. These are all issues that the Black Women's Roundtable and the Congressional Black Caucus are fighting for. We're proud to be a partner with you, Melanie, and the Black Women's um, Agenda. I will leave on this note. Anna Julia Cooper said, when and where the black woman enters. Mm, and on. the quiet, undisputed dignity of her womanhood. Okay. When and where the black woman enters in the quiet, undisputed dignity of her womanhood without suffrage and without patronage, there enters the entire Negro race. Black people don't enter without black women. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, I told you all. Thank you, Vince. Uh, we are so, so delighted and want to first thank Senator Van Hollen from the great state of Maryland, who is hosting us today. Senator, you have uh, Maryland in the house? Where's Robbie Whitty? So Maryland is in the house. We are, our summit is being hosted at the gay lord. Yes, We're indeed. spending money in the state of Maryland. Excellent. Uh, right, <laughs> right, right, right. Thank you. Um, Senator, and, um, so thank you for, he is our host. So thank our host. I do want to just read if you don't mind. I do want them to know. Okay. Uh, Senator Chris Van Hollen uh, is elected to the United States Senate by the people of Maryland in November 2016. Uh, Senator, Senator Van Hollen is committed to fighting for every day every day, fighting every day, to ensure that our state and our country live up to their full promise of equal rights, equal justice, and equal opportunity. So repeat after me. I say equal rights, equal, rights, equal, justice, equal justice, and equal opportunity. And equal opportunity. Technology is wonderful when it works, right? <laughs> Senator Van Hollen believes that every child Say every child. Every child. Every child. Deserves the opportunity to, the opportunity to pursue their dreams and benefit from a quality education. And, and that everyone willing to work hard should be able to find a good job. That, and you have to repeat, I'm just going to say this last thing. That's why his top priorities include creating more and better jobs, strengthening small businesses, and increasing educational and job training opportunities for individuals of all ages in every, in every, every community. Senator Van Hollen, tell Thank us what you, you want us to know. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Melanie. It's great to be here with you. It's great to be here with the Black Women's Roundtable yeah. and with the National Coalition on Black Civic Participation. Thank, you. Thank all of you, and it is um, an honor to team up with the CBC. Thank you all for your leadership um, and to host this gathering uh, today here in the United States uh, Senate. I just wanted to come to thank you, to thank the, the coalition, to thank the roundtable uh, for all the work that you've done over so many years, I think 12 years now, in terms of advocating to make sure that our country does 
live up to the promise of equal rights and equal justice and equal opportunity and to make sure that we have an equitable society yeah. uh, where yeah. everybody gets a fair chance and that we also make sure that everybody has that opportunity to have a good job and a good paycheck. Uh, and when it comes to women, we have to deal with the equal pay for equal work yeah. uh, issue. Yeah. Yeah. I, I want to thank all of you because black women have been at the forefront of the fight in our country yeah. for justice and liberty uh, since the earliest days of our country. Uh, I just came from my, my office in the Capitol, um, and on my wall there um, hangs the portrait of a great Marylander and a great American, Harriet Tubman. Yeah. Uh, and um, we are fighting to make sure that Harriet Tubman has her rightful place on the $20 bill. Yeah. Uh, and we in Maryland are working very hard to get a statue of Harriet Tubman in the United States Capitol. So I want to thank all of you for carrying the torch that has been carried from Harriet Tubman to so many other black women over the years. Uh, because you, when it comes to casting your votes and calling for change, you are the ones who have moved our country yes. forward. Yes. Uh, I want to thank you for what you did to help make progress possible over the last two years. Yes. Over the last two years. Um, yes. And we did a lot together, um, including uh, ensuring that we have the first black woman on the Supreme Court of the United States. Justice Katanji Brown Jackson. Katanji Brown Jackson. That was made possible because black women and voters around the country came together to elect a president and a vice president who made justice and equity a priority in the United States of America. And that, of course, uh, gets to the fundamental issue of voting rights. Because what we know is that as we gather here, there are state legislatures around the country that have already enacted and are in the process of enacting laws to erect barriers to make it harder for people to vote, especially to make it harder for people of color and younger people to cast their ballots, which is why, which is why we need, as you have called for, a national law to protect the right to vote across the country. That is the... The John, the John Lewis Voting Rights Act and the Freedom to Vote Act. Uh, because we shouldn't have different standards. The standards should be everybody, every citizen should be able to have access to the ballot box without having to jump over a lot of hoops or stand in long, long lines that are specifically designed to make people get tired of voting. Now, black women have never gotten tired right. of voting, but there's no reason that people should have to jump over extra hoops to exercise their right to vote in the United States of America. And we have to deal with issues of public safety. We need to get these weapons of war, these semi-automatic assault weapons off our streets uh, and have common sense gun safety laws. Uh, and we need to make sure that we have criminal justice reform. Uh, and end the national scandal of mass incarceration uh, in the United States of, of America and have constitutional uh, policing uh, and pass things uh, like the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. So we have a lot of work to do, including on the education front, including on the health care front. And I just want to end with this. We made progress in the last two years. We've helped lower the cost of prescription drugs for people on Medicare, Thank including you. insulin. Um, but we have a lot of work to do, uh, to do that across the country. Uh, and, of course, deal with women's maternal health, especially yeah. black women's yeah. maternal yeah. health. Yeah. Uh, and so we look forward to working with you uh, to make sure that we have an equitable health system, uh, equitable education system. Um, and, of course, uh, in terms of speaking to the Supreme Court, uh, there's the good news from the court, mm -hmm. Justice Jackson. There was the bad news, of yeah. course, from the court, which was overturning Roe v. Wade. Right. Uh, right. And as we speak, we also know Texas and other states are making it harder for women uh, to exercise their yes. reproductive freedom and reproductive rights. So whether it's health care, education, public safety, all these issues, we have made progress in the last two years, but we got a long way still to go. So I want to thank all of you because you are the engine. Uh, you're the, 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 the fuel that helps move this country forward. Um, and I'm grateful for all you do and look forward to continue to work with you in Maryland and around the country for years to come. And for all of you who aren't from Maryland, 
Come on over. We love to have you in Maryland. Take care and God bless you. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Mar yeah. Marylanders, and uh, yeah. what are Maryland people? Come on up, Maryland. Yeah. So get it. Well, well, he All right, to Maryland. Maryland. <laughs> come come on right. over. Where's Robin? Where's Robin? Did she step right away? Here. Come on, and, Robin. And Maryland, we're very proud of our, our new Wallace governor, is. Governor Wes yeah. Moore. Yes. Come on over. Wow. <laughs> okay. Um, and then while we're, we're coming up, I did want to make sure uh, any Marylanders that come up want to get a, get a photo with him before he leaves. All right. uh, but what I want to also let you know, and I forgot to say this, our honorary chair yes. is someone I know you know pretty well, uh, and that's Chris George's county executive, Angela Angela Alserbrooks. Right, is our She's honorary amazing. chair, uh, and we've been over there for two years. Angela so Alserbrooks is uh, an amazing county executive, yes, worked is. very closely with yes. her. In fact, they just got a note from her this morning. <laughs> she's good. Uh, yeah. So she's, she's doing a great job. Right. Thank you. But can we give our, 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 our senators <laughs> right? yes, uh, a, a round of applause? Thank you yeah. so very much again, for hosting us. And I think folks are coming to see And you. I will say, anyone from the District of Columbia, we need statehood for the District. <laughs> Of Columbia. Yes. We need democracy and self determination for the people of District of Columbia. All right. All right. Thank, well, thank you very you, much. David. Thank you so very thank much. You. All right. Yeah. The and the, yeah. We'll see you in the office. <laughs> and then y'all can go take a picture. Yeah. Yeah. Y'all can go take a picture with us. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you. Thank you again, Senator Van Hollen. Uh, and so we're going to have um, some quick um, um, uh, uh, remarks. Uh, because we want to make sure that folks don't miss their appointments. We're doing good on time. Say we're doing good on time. So this next wave of folks is quite a few. Um, um, because we want, when the state leaders come up, make sure you bring your Black You Vote coordinator if you have one with you so that you all can share in your comments. So, but we're going to start with uh, some of our um, policy lead, leads uh, with, the, uh, with the coalition. Uh, Jocelyn Tate who's our senior policy advisor, tech policy advisor, and all things policy advisor, quite frankly, uh, who has an exemplary record around issues around technology and tech policy and how that impacts when you talk about equity and opportunity. She in there fighting the fight uh, and represents us on the FCC Advisory Council. Am I correct, Jocelyn? Uh, so she, Jocelyn Tate will come up to talk about our priority issue around privacy. Following Jocelyn, you will hear from Carol Joyner, uh, who is uh, uh, with uh, Family uh, Values Action. Did I say that right? Executive yes, Director for Family Absolutely Values right. Action, uh, who is our uh, sister and partner. All are members of Black Women's Roundtable as well, who will focus on economic security, specifically issues around paid family leave, and also weigh in a little bit on equal pay and how important that is. Following her, you will hear from Cassandra Welchin, who, is, who leads the um, Mississippi Coalition on Black Civic Participation, Mississippi Black Women's Roundtable, has been a fighter in the state of Mississippi around issues around um, economic justice and opportunity for black women and our children, deal with issues of child care and, and many, many other things. She will focus on reproductive rights and equal rights Follow her, Helen Butler, voting rights, and I think you have um, Mary, Mary Pat Hector with you um, as well, and then Honorable Sheila Tyson, who will focus on, from, Al from the great state of Alabama, who leads Black Women's Roundtable in Alabama, Helen Butler, I forgot to say her title, Executive Director, Georgia Coalition for the People's Agenda, uh, and Georgia Black Women's Roundtable, and the Georgia folks could come up at that time. So if you're here, when we call your state, y'all come up and y'all... Uh, do that together, and then we have other states that we'll call on uh, accordingly after that. We're all impacted by the culture, whether we know it or not. From politics to music and entertainment, it's a huge part of our lives, and we're going to talk about it every day right here on The Culture with me, Faraji Muhammad, only on the Black Star Network. Hey, I'm Donnie Simpson. What's up? I'm Lance Gross, and you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered.
when nobody else will show up. I see a brother, if I text him and say, Ro, I need, boom, when, where, I'm there. And we don't take that, Roland, for granted. And so we were on the hill, because Roland, Roland, Roland like talk, talk about boats, like, what you coming to D.C. for? You don't go nowhere but me in the, in the ballroom. Well, we outside of the ballroom, ladies, today. We, well, we, were, we, we went to, um, uh, on the Senate side today to make sure that we weighed in and we took our agenda to these folks, Democrats and Republicans. And so I just want to thank you. And I, we wanted to make sure that we showed you our love. And, Roland, if you haven't made a contribution to his media platform, 100% Black Owned, we need to do that. So I, we need to do that. If it ain't but $10, do that. So, Roland, um, we're not going to keep, I know, and I know you just got off there, I'm sure. And so we're going to have you come up um, and uh, get us started. We've got our sister, Jocelyn Tate, who's going to interview you, who is our senior policy advisor, uh, extraordinaire uh, for tech policy but also is a bad sister from Memphis, Tennessee, who speaks truth to power when she goes and sits there at the Federal Communication Commission. Am I getting that right, George? Well, I said FCC. Uh, and make sure that she weighs in and makes folks understand uh, that the issues of privacy is a civil rights issue of the day. And so turn it over to my sister Jocelyn, just to have this five-side chat. And after that, we will uh, provide, uh, Roland will provide uh, signed copies of the book, and that's um, and sponsored by Black Women's Roundtable. Thank you. Well, Jocelyn. Thank you so much, Melanie. And thank you so much, Roland, for coming today to share this book with us today, White Fear, how the browning of America is making white folks lose their mind, lose their doggone mind. <laughs> so we just want to start first. I want to start talking. In the book, you said that by 2043, no ethnic group will be the majority in America. Mm. Now let's unpack that and see why that's making white people lose their doggone minds. Well, you might remember probably about 30 years ago when the story first came out saying America will be a nation majority of people of color. Then it was really like 2060. And people kind of like, oh, man, that's so far away, we'll be dead. Uh, then it started dropping from 20, 50, 60 to 57, 55, 53. Then it went all down to 43. And by 2039, the majority of the working class in the country will be... Uh, people of color. Uh, so 47% of whites would be, uh, the population would be 47% white, then you have Latino, African Americans, Asian, Native American, comprising 53%. Now, even inside of that, you have to then begin and look at, well, even what's happening with, within Latino slash Hispanic, because you have a number of people who identify as white Hispanic, who identify as more as white than Hispanic. Uh, so you have that dynamic as well. But re so really what, what it is called, it caused, it caused a lot of people to start freaking out. But really what did it for me was in 2009, uh, around the inauguration, uh, a study was released and the question was asked, are you optimistic about the future of America for your children? Every group, black, Latino, Asian, every group majority said yes, except white America. Now, normally when you look at these stories, how media typically works, uh, they're just sort of, they look at the story, don't ask that next question and the next question. And, I, and that caught my attention. Uh, and I began to look, look into it further. And then you begin to see, again, how folks start reacting. So I remember I was at CNN, and when I was, when I was there, John um, Avalon and I were off air, and we were about to go on. And I said, John, we are living in the beginning stages of white minority resistance. And he's like, what are you talking about? I said, white folks are about... This thing is about to get real. 
even the majority, you're about to see the tension because they cannot handle this demographic shift. And then I think it was on the time or Newsweek did a story that showed that the average death rate in about 10 states was higher than the average white birth rate. So that means there were more white folks who were dying than they were being born. So then when you, so when you start looking at uh, how aggressive folks got over the issue of immigration, then you start talking about great replacement theory, then you begin to see all of these attacks on DEI and multiculturalism and critical race theory, anything dealing with black folks and others advancing, you, you see what's happening. The reason I chose that picture for the cover, uh, which is from January 6th, so the picture is of a white man with his arms outstretched in front of the Capitol, where for me that picture says, all of this is ours. Because you got to remember, when Donald Trump was complaining about losing, he kept mentioning four cities. Exactly. Atlanta, Philadelphia, Detroit, Milwaukee. Mm -hmm. Those are black cities. Mm -hmm. So the anger was at black folks. They were pissed off at losing Georgia because black folks turned out in massive numbers. So when you start breaking all of these statistics, column, and it's very interesting. I've had black hosts of mainstream shows call me and say, I would love to have you on my show, but my white producers don't like your book title. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, you know, I talked about those very people in the book. So the reason mainstream media, white media, can't deal with white fear is because they're white. They don't want to confront the exact same situation. Uh, and so you have white executives, you got largely white producers who are controlling the information flow, uh, which is why, matter of fact, just a side note, today is the 196th anniversary of the founding of the nation's first black newspaper, Freedom's Journal, uh, March 16th, 1827 which they said in their third paragraph, we wish to plead our own cause too long have others spoken for us. So this is a perfect example of why you have to have black owned media because even white media does not want to confront this. That's why in 2016, they kept talking about economic anxiety. And that was always the dumbest thing to me because I was kind of like, well, if you look at numbers, black folks are broken than anybody else. So hey, we should be the most, uh, have the most anxiety about the economy. Mm -hmm. But they kept focusing on that. And really what that was about was all of these white folks were, I'll never forget, that was a story. And this white guy was complaining that he wished they could go back to the days of when he could just call his boss to get his son hired. And I was laughing at the story because what angers them is that they now have to compete. Exactly. And so when you start looking at that academics and everything else, that's really what's been pissing them off, that they now have to compete. The nation that they used to control, they now can't control it the same way. And that's, and that's the underpinning of so many different things, and media does not want to get at the heart of it. And I've literally been discussing this since 2009. And so, and in predicting what's about to happen, so all this anti-CRT stuff, the tax on DEI, saw it all coming, and too many of us were actually falling asleep without realizing that they are trying to solidify power for the next 50 to 100 years. And so let me put this, understand, remember, there was a 35-year-old white woman that Trump and McConnell appointed as a federal judge. She was 11 years removed from law school. Okay, had no business being a federal judge. Mm -hmm. If she retired at the same age or past that woman will be on the federal bench until the 2069. Mm -hmm. 2069. And so that's why when I'm trying to explain to our folk why you can't act like Judge Katanji Brown Jackson is no big deal to the Supreme Court and the, the federal judges, the black federal judges that Biden has been appointing with the Senate Democrats is no big deal because these white conservatives are looking at how can we control every level of power for the next 50 to 100 years? Which means that when you get to 2043, they might, yeah, y'all got numerical numbers, but we still have power. And my fear is that we will be like South Africa. We will have the political power, but they will still control the economic power, the judicial power, and still control the country. And, and you, so you unpack that a little bit about the judiciary. 
because talk about you, how Mitch McConnell was holding up, you said in the book, oh, absolutely. He was holding up everything so he could get uh, yeah, uh, gorgeous, uh, um, uh, Gorsuch. Get, get all of the yeah. all of the conservative white judges on. And the they bench. were real clear. They were real clear. He gave an interview with Sean Hannity where they said. We are going after young judges. The judges were 35 to 45. Mm -hmm. they, if, you were, if you were 55, 60, you didn't have a shot mm -hmm. because they wanted folks who would be there at least 30, 40 years. Mm -hmm. And see, this is, and this is where Democrats, progressives, and black folks were completely asleep at the wheel, not just on the federal level, but you take the state level. I, I was just, I literally just walked off the air. And in 2020, there was an increase of 4% of black voters in North Carolina from 64 to 68% from 2016 to 2020. Okay. Now that's great. But if you go back to 2008, look at how black turnout was. The reason Obama wins North Carolina by 14,100 votes because you had massive black turnout. Of course, they then put in place massive voter suppression, voter ID to bring the number down. You had more Mondays, repairs of the breach, poor people's campaign fighting to bring it back. But here's what happened in 2018. Sherry Beasley loses by 400 votes on the North Carolina Supreme Court. She was chief justice. Now, you might remember, Democrats took over the Supreme Court. That's how they ruled against racial gerrymandering, against voter ID and which fought a lot, a lot of that back. She loses by 400 votes. Had she won, Democrats would have a six to one advantage on the state Supreme Court. It went down four to three. 2022, they just lost one of those seats. Republicans now control the state Supreme Court four to three. What did they just do? The courts issued a ruling in two cases, a gerrymandering case and a racial and a voter ID case six months ago when there was a Democratic majority. Now that they took control in January, they're going to rehear those cases. So now you're talking about, because again, they understand that with three branches of government, legislative, executive, and judicial, judicial has the final say so. Mm -hmm. So while folk have been sitting here worrying about who's going to be in the White House, who's going to be in the Senate, in the Congress, they've understood if we control the courts, it matters. That's why that special election in, uh, in a few weeks in Wisconsin is so important because uh, there's a, if the Democrat, if the, woman, if the white woman who's running wins, that court flips. Now that court flips, they now can rule against gerrymandering. Now that completely changes the makeup of the courts in Wisconsin. And so we have to understand they have been plotting this because they've been pissed off since Brown was Board of Education. They were angry with, uh, with the appeals court in the Fifth Circuit who was really making all the different rules coming through the civil rights movement. So that's really what the Christian Affairs Society is. And so they are sitting here playing a long game. We was, folks were talking about, oh man, it's, even Biden was saying that BS, uh, things don't get back to normal when Trump. I'm like, no, player, things are not getting back to normal when Trump is out. They, the, part, the, the, the Republican Party of Trump is the Republican Party. And so what we have to understand is we are simply not even maximizing our numbers. There was a massive drop off in South Carolina in the last election of black voters. Mm -hmm. You look at, look, Warnock only won by 95,000 votes. Okay. Uh, and let me be real clear. If it was not for the third party groups on the ground, he would have lost. <laughs> let me be real clear. Because his campaign, I know, I know, because his campaign, his campaign was weak as hell. They were not doing what they were supposed to do. They were, they had not put any money in any black newspaper until late September. Now, they don't look like, I ain't got a problem because they even try to come to me with small money. I tell them to go to hell. Uh, you're not going to see them play me small. And so we have to, and so when I, I was just on the breakfast club yesterday trying to explain, I'm like, look, we had a, if we are voting, at 65 to 70 percent of our numbers, we sweep seats statewide. If you got 500,000, and so and when I'm bringing out white fear, so here's a perfect example. Anti-CRT, we many of us were asleep. That propelled all the white folks to the ballot in 2020, 2021. In South Carolina, Moms for Liberty, that crazy right wing group, took over 10 of the 14 largest school districts in South Carolina. What did they immediately do? Start firing superintendents. Start changing curriculum. That's black folks. Yep. So we have to be in a constant state of educating and lighting. We keep telling folk vote. I can't, you can't vote unless you get 
uh, unless you register, but you can't register unless you're enlightened. You can't be enlightened unless you get educated. And so right now we have to be engaged in an aggressive education and enlightenment campaign for next year to walk folks through because they are executing their strategy. What Ron DeSantis did in Florida by attacking the AP curriculum, that was the strategy. The story came out to now, here's what the next deal is. Right now, the next attack isn't uh, the history class, it's social studies. One of the book publishers said they went through the books and tried to remove race as much as they can even when it came to Rosa Parks for fear of violating the law that they passed. So then what did he do next? The DEI piece. What happened? They hit in Florida, then Texas picked it up, then North Carolina picked it up. So they are using the power where they control state legislatures to enact these policies because they do not want to see the advancement of African Americans and Latinos, and that's what's going on. And the reason media is so important is because that's how you're able to change hearts and minds. And so too many of us are listening to black radio and laughing and giggling and not being educated. And then when the stuff goes down, like that bill in Florida, I got some fools say, all in Florida was going to black fraternities. It's wrong. He was wrong. And I told this fool to stop tweeting, because you know what the hell you're talking about, because I call the black legislators in Florida. The, the bill was written in such a way that it could, it could impact them. You don't give them that sort of leeway because they are specifically writing the laws to eliminate as much of our power as possible. Because, and here's why the attack on the D9 is so important. Because the, because the Divine Nine, out of all the black institutions we have, is the most sophisticated and vertically and horizontally integrated. We're international, national, regional, state, grad chapter, undergrad chapters with programming impacts K through 12. And we are, other than the black church, we are self-funded. So if you attack, if, so they are attacking our pillars so if you attack the pillars of the black community, then you are in position to simply attack us in every other way. Now, you talked about how th this strategy, because this, this strategy is real. White, white people are afraid and they're attacking, the, and they are using the judiciary strategically. They're using voter suppression strategically. They're using education strategically. Now you talk in the book about the black republic. How are they being used strategically? Well, it's very, look, right now you have the largest number of black Republicans in Congress that you've had uh, since, um, since the 1800s. Uh, and so uh, what, is, what, is happening, what is happening there, you got uh, John James who was elected in Michigan. You've got Byron Donalds who was in Florida. Of course, you got Tim Scott. And so what they then say is, oh, my goodness, you can't call us racist because, therefore, uh, we, have, uh, we have these black Republicans. Uh, and so they are also living in denial about exactly what is going on. Uh, and so you got the brother who's lieutenant governor in North Carolina who's talking about running for governor as well. And so and, and the thing for me is, let's be real, this, this, for me, it's not a question of who's blue who's red, who's Republican, or who's Democrat. The question is, where do you sit when it comes to the policies and how they impact people? Uh, a Michael Steele black Republican is different from a Byron Donalds black Republican. Mm -hmm. well, we, we've known black Republicans all our lives, but the Ed Brooke black Republicans, for the most part, do not exist anymore. And so we have to understand, and a lot of them are actually coming from districts that are 70, 80, 90% white. And so they are advocating policies that are absolutely against us. Uh, you know, so you, you take Senator Tim Scott, for example, uh, who is literally doing the bidding of these folks uh, who, who have our interests at heart. And so he gets on the floor. He talks about uh, oh, how he's been racial pro racially profiled. When you look at the George Floyd Justice Act, he was the one who actually he killed it. He killed it because one of the most violent uh, 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 sheriffs in all of South Carolina came out against it. Uh, 
And he used that as the reason why he didn't want to support it. Then he goes on Face the Nation. He says the Democrats wanted to defund uh, police, and that was a bridge too far. Now, here's why that's interesting. A year earlier, uh, Michael Harry wrote a piece uh, in The Root where in Senator Tim Scott's own bill, they, he had a provision that said if laws were not passed, they couldn't access the money. So the very thing that he criticized Democrats on Face the Nation, he actually did a year earlier. Now, here's why I know he's full of shit. It's because when I text him, and I got the text, when I text him about the bill, oh, he was very responsive. He was very responsive. But then when I asked him, okay, what's the difference between what your bill said and what you're accusing Democrats of, he goes silent. I asked him five times. I asked his staff. Nobody wants to respond. And so he wants to stand out here and dance around and talk about, oh, how the bill died. No, bro, we know exactly what happened here because they don't want to deal with police brutality. They don't want. And the crazy thing is two of the police unions actually came out and said that what he said was wrong. They said, no, we the, the, the two of the unions said we have not heard any Democrats say defund the police in the negotiations. But he wants to run for president. Mm -hmm. And so he killed the George Floyd Justice Act to help his run for president. That's exactly what he did. And so we just have to understand what is at play here and, again, how these pieces are going. And, and I'm going to throw something else out there right now that, again, many of us ain't paying no attention to. You want to talk about white fear, where are most of our HBCUs there in the South? Mm -hmm. Most of them are state institutions. When you have all of these anti-DEI policies, those policies impact all state schools, including the HBCUs. Look, Tennessee, look what happened in Tennessee. The law lawmaker said that Tennessee owed Tennessee State about $500 million in being historically underfunded. When, his, when Tennessee State went to to the legislature asked for $250 million, then they said, let's do an audit. Then all of a sudden, oh, we have issues with the leadership, all kinds of different stuff, only when they start asking for more money. Ruth Simmons, who just resigned as president of Prairie View A&M, criticized the Texas A&M Board of Regents, same thing. And if you read her letter, we broke it down on my show, she basically was saying, alumni, students, faculty, y'all had better fight and take control of your school. So we have to understand by them having a grip on state legislatures, they literally will be, they are in control of most of our HBCUs. And so that's going to, that, I can, they already go out to Tennessee State. Watch, that's going to be the next frontier. They are going to then begin to exert control over HBCUs. So here we are shouting HBCUs, talking about football and basketball and bands. And they are going to be controlling the very places where we're graduating most of our professional class. If we don't understand the battle that's literally in front of us, we're going to get caught flat-footed. And that's why we have to be thinking multidimensional. That's why, but I've said this, and I don't care. I've said to black folks, do not, do not send a dime to the Democratic National Committee or to any, let me be real clear, to any political campaign, send that money to black organizations that are on the ground. Here's why. Mandela, Bar Mandela Barnes, and I don't care what he says, uh, Mandela Barnes would be the United States Senator from Wisconsin right now if he had not listened to those white consultants and ignored Milwaukee. That was a 50,000 voter drop-off in Milwaukee last year from 2018. He lost by 26,000 votes. Mm -hmm. He from Milwaukee. I had Milwaukee consultants who said they had no contact with the, with the Barnes campaign because the white consultants were like, yo, we got that. They put no money in Milwaukee. That's how he lost. Sherry Beasley lost North Carolina because she listened to white consultants who told her to run from black people. How does the black female vice president come to North Carolina and you don't show up where she's at? How, do, how are you black running for the United States Senate and you have no campaigns on HBCU campuses? 
And they can't say black folks are not trying to come in because I got the text where I was texting directly. When do you want me to come in with my show? They never called. Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying is we have to understand next year. Let's just be real clear. We know what they're not going to spend money on. So black folks should right now be saying we must be funding our our institutions that are in the states and because they are going to be driving voter turnout. And we know for a fact they will be putting that money on the ground in black radio, in black newspapers, in black media, in, on the ground game to get our folks out. Because for me, and Charlemagne asked me the question yesterday on the Breakfast Club, I said, he said, well, shouldn't Democrats be doing it? I said, I'm not going to wait on a party or a candidate to turn our people out when the policies have a direct impact on us. Mm -hmm. And all of these things, trust me, because this would happen in for Youngkin. Ter Ter Terry McCullough was an awful candidate. He shouldn't have run. Okay, he should not have run. But here's the deal. He didn't lose votes. White turnout was actually higher. They were simply more energized. And so we have to be fixated on taking our numbers up 5, 10, 20, 25%. If, we, if you look at Florida, Broward and Miami Dade, awful numbers. I had Nikki Frieda and I was like, yo, what you gonna do about those black numbers? You cannot win Florida if your numbers in Broward County and Miami Dade are under 60%. You DOA. And so this is a numbers game. And I'm gonna say one thing, cause you said something earlier. And most of us, again, are not looking at the data when you mentioned voter suppression. Uh, Terrence Woodbury, we had him on before the election and he said, we have to stop using voter suppression. I said, Terrence, why? Because all, all of his focus groups, his polling data, he said when young voters hear the phrase voter suppression, they immediately think the 1960s. Mm -hmm. He said, we use it as a catch-all. He said, but those same voters, well, that, when you, if you say they're closing your polling locations, mm -hmm. they're changing the hours, and they're getting rid of ballot drop boxes, that resonates more with them than voter suppression. Okay. because you're explaining it okay. then what he also said is he said the numbers don't lie when black voters are told your votes will make the difference they are more likely to vote than just saying you have to vote so the language that we use we have to change the language in communicating with our folk to get them to understand why they must turn out uh, because next year Trust me, the right, Axios did a story. They have, they have a working group as we speak, laying out a plan of action where they looked at everything Trump did and they said, this is how we're gonna do it next time. And they literally plan to fire several thousand government bureaucrats, workers, who folks who are just, who, who of course remember, we disproportionate of government workers. They are looking to fire them because they say, this is where we messed up last time. We're not going to mess up this time. So allowing them to get anywhere near the Oval Office will be absolutely catastrophic to black people. Now, you mentioned in the book now, so we do a lot of voter work, voter mobilization. So it's very good that you said that you told us about we need to change the term. We can't use voter suppression. That's not resonating. Yeah. So it's in his data. He lays it in the data. So, so we we so this is what we've got to do as we get ready to do our voter mobilization work. We can't use terms like voter uh, voter suppression. We've got to. So we'll be looking at that because these women these women are on the ground in the states. So we need to do what resonates with our communities. Now let me go to another point. We we're talking about the upcoming election. You said in the book, too, you cannot separate Trump from the Republican Party. That now, was the stupidest thing Hillary Clinton did. That was the stupidest thing. She, I was like, what the hell are you doing? I'm like, he's a GOP nominee. Because, see, and Biden did the exact same thing when he kept saying that he thought everything was going to return, uh, return back to normal. I was like, what are you doing? I'm like, bro, that's the party. See, wh what that is, that's white Democrats still thinking they can go get them Reagan Democrats. They gone. They gone. They ain't coming back. Then you have, again, this is what's, again, what's crazy to me with, with the language that, 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 that they use, because they still have this fallacy that, oh, if we could just 
connect with them, we can bring them back. You're going to have to spend so much time and money trying to get them when you can actually spend less money and less time going after folk who are more likely to vote for you who you simply haven't touched. They don't lie. And so what, it's, what has to happen right now, and again, this is where uh, how our, our mobilization has to operate differently. Yes, there are 501c3 organizations that are nonpartisan. But here's what has to happen. We have to have individuals and organizations who right now are putting massive pressure on all levels of uh, Democrat Party and progressive politics to say, where's our money? Right now, listen to me, not May 2024, right now. Biden campaign in 2016 was, oh my God, we have a $6 million expenditure of the $280 million they spent. There was $6 million expenditure for black targeted, black owned media that was, they, they were touting largest in history. And I was like, y'all got think I'm excited about six and you spending 280? Mm-hmm. And so, and see, and, and, and here's the other thing, don't get caught into the trap. Because folks say, what Jamie doing? First of all, the parties have changed. There's so much mother money flowing in, the DNC actually has the least amount of money. So you have the DNC, DCCC, DSCC, DLC, Democratic Government Association, but then you have all these progressive PACs. These progressive PACs ain't spending the money with us. So we need to be saying to progressive PACs, to Emily's List, Oh, and here too, right now, that we absolutely must be calling out to the carpet. Climate, organism, environmental lobby, crazy amount of money they spend, virtually no money to black people. Mm -hmm. Okay? I called him out last year, then all of a sudden my phone started ringing, because when Mustafa Santiago Ali said, you know he's going to keep hitting y'all. Y'all might want to call him. Uh, And so we're going to be doing something soon. But the other thing is, all of the Pro, all the pro-choice groups. Now they keep using us in all their ads, but if you follow the money, that money ain't being spent with us. And so we have to right now be calling folks out on the money because what they're going to want us to do is they're gonna want us to act as, as political sharecroppers mm-hmm. to do all of that work, till the soil uh, and go pick, the, go pick the same cotton, but then you ain't trying to pay. No, and and, and let me be real clear. In September, two political campaigns called me, because the the media folks called me, and they said, we got this money from this campaign, this money from this campaign, and it was $25,000 each, and they wanted this massive media plan. I said, for 50? I'm telling y'all straight up, this is no lie. I'm giving y'all a quote. This is exactly what I said. They talked to my salespeople who called me, and I said, is that what they told you? And I said, got it. I then put a text together and I sent this to both of the campaigns and I sent this to Clyburn, Beatty, Meeks, Jeffries, and about eight others. I literally said, fuck that. (laughs) I will keep my black ass at home. Good luck in your campaign. Now, why did I do that? One, you playing me small. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You want me to, you want me to, do you want ads? You want me to sit in there and cover stuff on the ground? I said, for 20, I said, y'all, I get 20,000 for a speech. That ain't happening. And they were like, oh my God. I said, no, that ain't happening. Not when I know for a fact. And see, understand how media works. Sinclair Television announced in their fourth quarter, they did $340 million in political advertising in all of their local TV stations. $340 million. And y'all thought I was going to accept 25 during the Biden campaign. Brother, they brother, they had called us who had no business even talking to us because he had no, no understanding of the media. He literally said, I can take $20,000 and give it to four black newspapers and they'd be happy. He said, we ain't them. Oh my God. And they oh said, here's a hundred thousand. We said, no. Oh my then they said, here's 200,000. I said, no. They said, final thing is fine. We're doing 300,000 advertising. That's it. I didn't answer for two weeks. Then when they said it's final, we accept it. Then when we signed it, I then cussed them out publicly. <laughs> and they got mad. I said, oh, y'all thought I was supposed to be happy. Now, 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 now why am I saying that? Because that's, and they literally told me, if I understand what I was told. Mm-hmm. I was told, of oh, the 25, 25, 
Well, you get more than anybody else in black media. So people have to understand. And so what then happens is this is what they expect us to do. Whether you, whether you are on the ground group, whether you black on media, they expect us to shut up, suck it up, take the crumb and treat the crumb like a meal. No, a crumb is a crumb. I'm a call a crumb a crumb. And so we have to say, so, say this stuff in real time. So I've been putting everybody on notice. Everybody. White House playing games when it comes to getting interviews and getting FaceTime with the president. I was like, cool. Well, I know who y'all going to need next year. And so you can play games with me right now. You can play do the gatekeeping, but I'm telling you what's going to happen next year. And I will purposely not talk about you. See, we have to learn, and that's what I'm saying now. We have to be making a level of demands now. Mm-hmm. And then and make it clear, don't come to us with small money. Because mm-hmm. he only won Georgia by 12000 he barely won Arizona. He only won Pennsylvania by a little more than 100,000. Did not win Michigan by many. The margins are going to be small in 2024. So every black vote is going to matter. And so, like my man, um, that great financier uh, said in American Gangster, uh, I'm going to get that money. Because if you ain't having a money conversation, you are not having an American conversation. Exactly, exactly. Oh, we're getting the. I'm getting the signal. I know y'all think I didn't cuss them out, but I did. I can show you the text. <laughs> I sure did. We, we believe you. We I sure did. We believe you, Roland. Sometimes folk don't understand <laughs> language except some other kind of language. Like, oh, okay, so y'all want to roll? Gotcha. <laughs> We believe you. We believe you. <laughs> we have no problem hey, believing that you did that. I'm telling you, follow the money. <laughs> well, Roland, thank you so much for spending this time with us. I'm getting the hook here that, that our time is up. What? <laughs> Girl, you got two more questions. Don't worry about Lon. Go ahead and ask your other two questions. Don't worry about him. Lon ain't running nothing. Go ahead and ask your two questions. Oh, we're going to take two questions on the oh, yeah, Don't worry about Lon. questions from the audience. We ain't worry about Does Lon. anyone in the audience have any questions they'd like to ask? Right over there. Oh, okay. Um, is there a microphone? Or, okay. Well, we we are we. Captain are, Hicks, we're, I got you. We're we're, we're, we're streaming, right, so, so we need the mic so that the people that are yeah, watching us. Yeah, we are we also streaming this on the Black Star Network right now. So. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Catherine Hicks. I'm from Philadelphia. I'm the president of the NAACP chapter yep. in Philadelphia. And I also own a black publication, the Philadelphia Sunday Sun. So what you are saying is very, very important and it resonates, especially with the elections that's coming up. So my question is for right now, I guess, you know, for the presidential um, election coming up, Biden is running again. Um, Is there something that we should be doing or even looking at um, as far as another candidate? Um, Because, again, you were saying that voter turnout is probably going to be less. Um, And if Biden is not the the choice of everyone. Yes, he is. What? what, what? He's going to be a nominee. Yes. No, he's going to be a nominee. Yes. So it's going to be him. It's going to be Republican. That's, I mean, that, mm-hmm. I mean, again, barring anything health wise or anything else, mm-hmm. as of right now, he's going to be the nominee. Marianne Williams is not going to be the nominee. Yeah, just not. So she, 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 I don't know how many votes she got last time. That ain't happening. No. Yeah. But, but, so, but, but, but what has to, but what has to be happening though is we have to be making a level of demands. The greatest time to ask for stuff is when somebody's running. Right. And so. If the White House tells us, well, we did this, this, this the first two years, we should say that was last year. Right. What about this year? So that was my That's where we have to be right now. And and let me clear, everybody does that. Every other group is doing that very same thing. I remember in in Obama's re-election, when they made the parent plus loan decision, all the HBCU people, it was the stupidest thing I ever heard in my life. I was sitting with them, and they purposely did not want to raise the issue. They said, well, we don't want to raise the issue uh, because of re-election. I said, fool, that's when you raise the issue. What are y'all doing? 
And then when election was over, they were mad because they didn't get what they wanted. I'm like, because y'all didn't say nothing. So what should be happening right now, we should be, again, we should be, whatever our agenda is, whatever individual groups should be applying that pressure to him, to the White House, to Democrats in the Senate, and to them in, 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 in the House as well, because the reality is they are going to all be, everyone in the House is running again in 2024. Yes. You're going to have Senate races up uh, in 24 as well. And so the political game is not you wait till it's over. Now, there are people out there who yell, all these fools, fools yell is tangible. Then they say, if I don't get this, I don't get the vote. First of all, you can't get Jack. First of all, they can make a promise, but they can't do Jack unless they get elected. So if you don't vote, fool, you can't get your tangible. Absolutely. But the problem for many of our many of us is we say nothing after the fact. So that's what's also going on. When the election is over, a lot of us check out as opposed to say, no, that's why you got to stay checked in. Yeah. And so that's why this group is important. The, the, the mobilization is important because too many of our groups are waiting after the fact. And then we wait for something to blow up, then go, oh, let's show up. I have been saying for years all across the country, you take the D9 for an example, as the Vine 9 and I, I talked to the AKs, Eastern Regional, just a couple of weeks ago. I said this to the Alphas, to the Deltas, uh, to all of them. In every city, each fraternity and sorority should say, okay, this month, y'all going to the city council meeting. Y'all going to the school board meeting. Y'all going to the county commissioners reading. Then you rotate the, the, the next month. First of all, it's nine of them. Each one of those entities are only meeting 10, 11 times a year, so you're probably only going to go there one or twice. But what has to happen is we have to be using our organizational power to be able to change the problem that we have. And let me be clear, you belong to many organizations. The fundamental problem that we have is on the political issues that we face, all too often collectively, Al alphas, AKs, Deltas, Omegas, Sigmas, Iotas, Zetas, uh, Kappas, everybody, and Eastern Star, and Prince Hall Mason, yeah. and Lynx, and many uh, church organizations are quiet. This is what Dr. King said in Where Do We Go From Here, Chaos or Community. He said there are four institutions that are prime positioned to liberate black America. He said the Negro church, the Negro press, Negro fraternities and sororities, and Negro professional organizations. That's what he wrote in Where We Go From Here. Now, this is also in how he unpacked that. Uh, he said, and I quote this all the time so I can pretty much do it without reading it. He said, there are still too many Negro churches that are so absorbed in a future good over yonder that they condition their members to adjust to the present evils over here. To media, too many Negro newspapers have veered away from their traditional role as protest organs agitating for social change and have turned to the sensational and the conservative in place of the substantive and the militant. Too many Negro social and professional groups have degenerated into snobbishness and a preoccupation with frivolities and trivial activity. But the failures of the past must not be an excuse for the inaction of the present and the future. And so when I look at it right now, Corporate America making 50 to $60 billion in commitments in the wake of George Floyd's death. And then what has happened in the last year? 36% of all DEI jobs have been wiped out. 75% of all DEI jobs are white folks. DEI jobs. And so here's the question I have for the Executive Leadership Council, which is an organization made up of corporate America. Why in the hell aren't y'all being more vocal about that $60 billion in commitment from corporate America, but y'all spend more time posting job appointments, but you're not, you're not advancing that? Black organiz the point of black organizations is to organize. If we are so preoccupied with what's happening on the inside of our groups, then we ain't fighting for the advancement of black people as a collective. So that's how we have to challenge black organizations to actually do more. Okay. Okay. You heard it right here. We have to challenge our organizations. We have to do that. And I'm a life member of Alpha, and trust me, I got the last four presidents on speed dial. I, they know I ride them. Look, I call out the boule at our convention. 
I said, how in the hell we got we here? I, I ain't got a problem. What you, what, they want to kick me out? Knock yourself out. I literally said to Sigma Pi Phi, how in the hell are we here in the Bahamas and we got an election in November, we got all these damn parties going on, and we don't have a single public policy session, and we got people sitting in the office who are running for office? Come on now. They were like, Come on. Well, and I, so Come I was on. like, I said, don't invite me next time then. But that's 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 part of the deal. We we have to be willing to challenge these groups because why do you exist and you spend 12, 14, 16 hours on meetings? And I'm like, like, I don't know what my wife a Delta. I don't what the hell they be meeting my life. They ain't got that much internal business. <laughs> and the same with Alvis. I'm seriously, we have to we have to ask ourselves, what are we doing with our organizational power? That's outside of the walls of our organization. That's what we. That what we, otherwise, all we're doing is beating a uh, full good time. All right. We got one more one question. question. What a microphone. Who got it? Who got it? Oh. Okay. Come on, doc. You got to be pre- up front and present. You can't be walking way back there. Uh uh-uh, uh Over there. Over okay. there. See over okay. there. Is that? Clearly, you did not grow up watching Donahue. <laughs> He's like, I have no idea who Phil Donahue is. Hello, hello. Uh, my name is Nashana Kess. I am the second vice president for the NAACP in Baltimore. And I am also the basis of the Alpha Alpha Sigma chapter of Sigma Gamma Rho Sorority Incorporated. Um, so what I wanted to ask was, there's two questions. One is, I have a friend in Dauphin County, Pennsylvania. She is running for um, a judge seated with the Court of Common Pleas. Her name is Latasha Williams. Um, So anybody in Pennsylvania, (laughs) please keep an eye out. Um, She ran two years ago. One of the issues was that we we did not get out and vote. Uh, Harrisburg did not get out and vote. She would be the first black woman on the sitting on the court of common pleas, but we can't get people out here to vote because they have no clue what the com- court of common pleas is. Okay. So what happens in the ele- what happens in elections again? This is where we want to say education and enlightenment. Look, the average person, black, white, they are not us. They are not well versed in all this stuff. They just like we ain't got no clue. So Joe Madsen is a great phrase. You got to put it where the ghost can get it. We have to break it down in a way. So he, so the question is, what does the court of common pleas do? And so when you're talking to folks, they, they, cause what's her name again? Latasha Williams. Okay, so here's what happened. Folks probably going around, we need you to vote for Latasha Williams. They're going to say, okay, who, who Latasha Williams? Well, oh, she's running for this. Okay, I don't know what that is. Because if you look down ballot, those pictures are the lowest, uh, lowest vote totals. What we have to say is, Again, I don't know what that court does, but let's just say, uh, so So why have things changed with district attorneys? Because folks finally said, you know, the DA actually has a direct impact on mass incarceration than any judge. The DA comes before the judge. So the reason you now have more progressive DAs, because we started changing the language on why you got to vote for the DA. And so for the judges, what we have to say is, this is what these judges do. They deal with these cases, these cases, these cases. That's why we need to assist on the court. I guarantee they're gonna look at you and go, that's what they do? Most people have no idea. In Harris County, uh, six years ago, or was it four years ago, they had 18 black women who were running for for judicial positions. They ran as a block. The reason Republicans got rid of straight ticket voting in Texas was because Democrats in Harris County figured it out and used it against them. So I went down and helped, and we traveled all day with, with those 18 sisters as they were gathering uh, to vote. But they were explaining to people what judges do. And so that's what we have to do. We have to, we have to connect what the judges do so our people go, that's what they do? Yes. So when your child or your cousin or your church member goes before a judge, this is one of the judges. This who will decide whether they go to juvenile or whether they go to prison or whether they go to defer or get some kind of deferred case. So we have to explain to our people what the judges do. The second thing is most important. You say she lost. I would ask, what did she lose by? Very little. That's my point. Very little. Which then, so then what has to happen, we got to go straight old school. Okay, voting numbers are public. You could literally go down and pull a precinct and see this precinct has 700 registered voters. 
38 voted. Well, if she lost by a couple of hundred, that one precinct, if you literally go door knocking that one precinct three to four times, that one precinct could put her over the top. So here's this is what this is what we keep doing. And I'm telling you, I travel all around the country and I see it everywhere. So I ain't picking on nobody. What we do is we go, man, we got to vote and hope they show up. I and every group that I've been a part of, I always counted votes. When I was on the board of National Association of Black National Association of Black Journalists, we pulled out a uni journalism color convention. We were in the board meeting and they were trying to fight to keep in. And they were like, well, why you ain't said nothing? I'm like, I ain't gotta say a damn thing. I got 12 votes in my pocket. Y'all can have all the conversation y'all want to. I said, I said, I already got the votes. This is all meaning, meaningless talk. So it's counting votes. We have to stop hoping they show up, look at the data, and then go, well, if we pick up 50 here times five precincts, that's 250 votes. Look at the last one. So if we're not looking at the data, that's where we're losing. And if you're spending your time in an area where they already are voting high, that's a waste of time. I'm going to go where, where the numbers are low and then say, and go back to what I said earlier, your vote could be the difference between getting this sister on, will you vote? And then we follow up three more times and then come election time, we then make sure they get to the polls, then that numbers change. That, that's old, old school politics is still new school. Hey, okay. That's, that's, that's one of our charges, ladies. Thank you so much, Roland Martin. Let's give it up for Roland Martin, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And Melanie, I'm going to turn it over to you, but Roland will be signing books in just a moment. Thank you. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. You're awesome, bro. Appreciate it. Appreciate right, it. Come on over, y'all. Um, they, they could do it with over there. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's gonna be easier. <laughs> oh, we need that. 